Good afternoon everybody across the globe and welcome to the largest safari vehicle on the planet. We are coming to you live from Juma and Arathusa game reserves in the Tsavi Sands in the greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa, so in the top northeastern corner of our wonderful country. For those of you who don't know, my name is Janie and I have Jandre on camera with me this afternoon. And it promises to be, as always, a wonderful and sometimes unexpected sunset safari. My plan for the start. Hello everybody, good afternoon, and what a special, special way to start the afternoon with a little herd of elephants here on the northern end of quarantine clearings, but just outside of camp. These chaps have been feeding and having a drink at the Galago camp. Large numbers of elephants have come into the area today. You're most welcome, and I'd like especially to welcome Mrs. Elsha Eastor, mother of the inimitable David, who is on camera today. Show your mother your thumb, David, just to show her that you're alive. There we go. Uh, Mrs. Eastor, thank you for producing your son. He is a fine example of humanity, and I enjoyed working with him very much. My name is James Henry, in case you're wondering. Uh, well, that's for all of you who, in case you were wondering, and you are on a live safari with a whole lot of elephants here in the northeast corner of, Safa of, South, uh, safari, of South Africa, the iconic Kruger National Park, a beautiful little elephant there. And you're on a live safari, as I said, so please do talk to us throughout the course of the afternoon. Hashtag safari live, questions at wildearth.tv. If you're on the email, Mrs. Eastor, you can send through questions or perhaps comments about your son. Uh, perhaps a little bit that gives us insight into his character. He is, of course, virtually silent, and so we don't really know much about him. He could, be, uh, he could be a prophet, he could be a, a psychopath. We're not really sure at this stage. Anyway. Look at this little fellow. He's pushing the tree over and just trying to work out how on earth that complicated appendage on the front of his face functions. He is probably about, mm, probably only three or four months old, and that trunk is almost useless at this stage, simply because there are so many muscles and nerve fibers in it that it takes a long time for them to learn how to work. Now, I remember this morning that somebody asked Jamie if elephants ever stand on their trunks, and she said young ones do, they do, but you can see that little one there, his trunk doesn't reach the ground, and it doesn't reach the ground for a very good reason, and that's because it's so uncoordinated that were it to reach the ground, they would almost certainly stand on it all the time. An adult's trunk can extend to the ground. They've got a sort of concertina-like uh, arrangement of muscles, so they can stretch it forward and pull it back and stretch it forward and pull it back. Just following mum there. Looks like a very young mother. Unless it's a... it's just a relative. But there are elephants all over the place at the moment, and just to the left of us, David, there are some very close by only about six or eight meters away. Now, one of the advantages to being as large as an elephant, as, or as large an animal as an elephant, on a hot day like this, it's about 34 degrees Celsius, they'd say. It feels like about 58 degrees Celsius. Um, 33 in, 34 in Fahrenheit is about 92, if I'm not mistaken. I've forgotten that. Um, 93, no, I'm pretty close going. The advantages of being a large animal like this is that you gain heat slowly. And that means that you can be out in the sun longer than, say, a bush baby could be, or a bushveld gerbil, for example. They'll heat up very fast indeed, and so they need to be very careful about maintaining cool. It's often why small animals live in burrows or in little nests in trees like bush babies do because they'll either overheat or get very cold very quickly. And so you can afford to be in the sun if you are a little, if you are an elephant. You can afford to be in the sun for longer than if you're little. 
We had a little bush baby in the camp actually earlier this afternoon. We don't know what it was doing. It looked like it had sort of fallen out of its nest. And bush babies, of course, go into what we call a torpor. Let's see, I'm going to talk about that just now. Let's just watch this cow quickly. Mm. Hello, madam. Ah, she's going to show us precisely what she thinks of us. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, more. Last, last little ball has come out. There we are. Marvellous. Yeah. It does amaze me how often animals choose to engage in their afternoon or morning constitutionals just as we sort of get a view of them. It's a, I wonder if it's a sort of indication of how they feel. Now, there are a few more that are on the clearing there, and I want to go a little bit forward and have a look at them because they're right out in the open, and I think there are two or three young bulls there, and they might head down to have a drink a bit later. Um, I know that Jamie went black screen, so I'm not sure if she got to tell you the news that she was looking for the Nkuhuma Pride. Now, word on the Bush Telegraph is that they crossed uh, sort of east out of Arethusa onto Vuyatela or Juma sometime during the course of the morning, I think just after we had gone home for breakfast. So we're going to try and find them at some stage during the course of the afternoon. Wherever they are now, they will almost certainly be fast asleep doing absolutely nothing, which is of course what lions do for 90% of their lives. But they will hopefully later on get moving and of course we are operational now sort of for half an hour in the dark so we might get some interesting action there and i think they've either gone probably towards sydney's dam to have a drink there that was jamie's first thought and i think that's probably quite a good postulation otherwise they may just be lying in the thickets over here so we'll go and have a look at some stage during the course of the afternoon as well but i think for now these elephants are going to provide some wonderful excitement for us. All right, let's go back to Jamie quickly, get an introduction from her. She can tell you better than I can what her ideas are, and I will stick with these elephants. Okie dokie, let us try that once again. I was in the middle of trying to say to you that there were tracks of the Inkuhuma lionesses coming across from Arethusa onto Juma around Power Lines Road. Now that was a report that I received from Taxon this morning. From what he told me, those tracks were not fresh as in first thing this morning. They were probably from late yesterday afternoon, maybe early yesterday evening. And now the question is, where are they? And how are we going to decide where they've gone? Now, the chances of them staying in the block that their tracks are seen crossing into are fairly slim unless they've killed something in there. In which case, at this point on a hot day like this, there's a very good chance that vultures or other birds of prey could actually be hugely beneficial for us in terms of finding them. So our plan of attack, I know that James is going to come and help me. I've come all the way down to the south. I was checking Treehouse Dam when I disappeared abruptly from your screens. I'm working my way up from the south and towards the last position of the tracks. I assume that James is going to do the same movement but from the north. And we'll see if we can't figure out where they've gone. And while I continue on my search for the lions, an elephant baby is doing some wonderful things, so let's pop over there. So we found across, we, we've come across here, half trunk, the elephant. That's her there in your picture. Oh, sorry, it's not. No, that's her, that's her, probably either her first child. No, hang on, hang on one second. So Dave, if you can come to the right a little. There we go. That's the half trunk female. We've been seeing her a while. Now she's got a new calf who's there just in your picture there, only about three or four weeks old probably, maybe up to six weeks. Then she's got two others who are normally with her. We think both her offspring, the one probably coming up behind 
and then I think uh, the one far behind there. Right, then she's got two more friends today. We haven't seen these ones before with her. The first one that Dave started on looks like a pregnant female. She looks like she might give birth fairly soon. That's the one on the left-hand side of your screen. And then in the far distance, the half-trunk female's other... Could be a sibling, could be her very first offspring. So her little herd, which is normally just four, has swelled to six. And the little, little one... Well, not the little one, but the one in front of her, to the right of your screen, is a young bull. <laughs> Carry on through here. James in Ohio, you a very nice question about heat. And of course, heat balance is a massively important part of any animal's life out here. Um, you want to know if thick skin helps with heat balance. James, I am, yes, I'm, I imagine it does help with heat balance quite a lot. An elephant's skin is interestingly not waterproof. And so while I don't think they have sweat glands, they can lose heat via evaporation in the same way that you and I can. But our skins, of course, are waterproof. That's not to say they fill up with water if they get into water, but it's not as waterproof as ours. Look at the little one there giving us a bit of a head shake, showing us how very big and strong he is. Yes. I just want to quickly see what this elephant is eating. Hello, Debbie. You're interested in why, when. Look at how brilliant that cow is. Just, Debbie, I'll get back to you. You can see that she's got her trunk has been chopped off, but she's completely managed to compensate for it by wedging the plants between her trunk and her foot. And that allows her to pick up whatever it is that she wants to eat. So I don't think her life is hampered at all by having that trunk chopped off there. Um, Debbie, you want to know when they start eating <laughs> in greenery? Well, look now. That little thing's just over a month old. It's already trying to start to eat greenery. And so they'll stop almost immediately, but they don't wean properly until they're about two years old. Sometimes even longer they'll try and suckle, but about two years old they'll suckle until. Now you can see that trunk is hopeless. It's not strong enough to, put, to, to, to tear the, the leaves off there. It's definitely not strong enough to actually be used to break off a piece of that plant. You're just kind of shaking it around a bit. Oh, this is fantastic. Look at that. Now, it's playing with something called a devil's thorn. And I don't know how edible those things are. Devil's horn, sorry. And the mother is not eating that plant. And she's being very selective about what she picks. And if you watch her trunk, it's like a, a selective vacuum cleaner. Feeling around for a specific type of plant and then selecting it, wedging it with her foot and pulling it out of the ground. There's a young bull making a noise. <laughs> This is fantastic. This is just very special. Ah, uh, well, uh, Luke, it's not that obvious. You say, aside from the obvious, how do you tell a male from a female elephant an adult? Um, Luke, it's not actually that obvious at all, given the fact that you can't see the external genitalia. So you cannot see a bull's testicles and you cannot see his penis either. They are within the sheath, which is actually very similarly positioned to a female's opening. And so it's, you can't look for genitalia. What you can look for, though, if you look at that cow, David, you can get in under her shoulder there. You can see that a, an adult cow, even if she hasn't had uh, calves, will have slightly swollen mammary glands and they're right under the shoulder there. You can see she's actually got fairly small ones and so not even though she's had at least two calves uh, but you can see in between her front legs uh, there's a very obvious swelling where in the bulls there clearly isn't. 
That's the easiest way, actually. You, people will tell you that you need to look at the, the shape of the forehead, that a female's got a much squarer forehead, a male more round, that a female's back is straighter, a male's more rounded. Yes, that is, those are both true. But, you know, you do get such variation. And then, once you find an enormous big bull, there's no mistaking it. Once you've seen an enormous big bull elephant, you can't replace it. You cannot confuse him for anything else. He is so much bigger than the females, almost a th third again the size of an adult cow. You can also, the tusks are a bit skinnier, and that's how I told um, David, you just get to this chap right in front of us here. This guy's gonna be a big tusker when he's older. Now that, I mean, unless I'm very much mistaken, I just took him for a bull, I didn't actually look. All I looked at was his tusks. They are quite thick, you can see they're much thicker than tusks of the same length on a cow, and they kind of point forward. So, I mean, unless I'm very much mistaken, that's a young bull. Although, I mean, <laughs> I'm looking at him now, and he's got a pretty straight back and a pretty square forehead, but he doesn't have any swelling between his legs, between his front legs, that would indicate mammary glands, but I might be wrong. Might be a young cow. I don't think so, though. So if you look at the tusks on our half-tailed cow there, Dave, to the left, you can see that they are much skinnier. And you can also see there, if you look carefully, a groove cut into the left-hand tusk. And what that groove is, is from her breaking branches off using the tusk, much like she's doing with her foot and the grass, wedging there, or not the grass, the little forbs that she's eating, wedging them between her trunk and her foot. She will wedge branches between her trunk and the tusk, and that's eventually led to that groove being cut in there. Now, eventually it'll break off, of course, that little piece. All right, let's go and have a look at Jamie. She's got some zebra. And if you look very carefully, at quite a distance through the leaves, you can see the herd of zebra that we were looking at. I had to stop for them just in case there's a chance that James and Dave's little zebra foal is amongst them. No sign, but they are quite far away and quite far into some dense bush. So that calf could well be there. I'm sorry, not calf. It's not a calf. It's a foal. Dearing me. And keep your eyes peeled. It might be in the back there somewhere. We're not that far from where James witnessed the birth, probably about a kilometer and a half, so just under a mile away. And already that little zebra foal within hours of its birth would have been capable of wandering through. But since we're here, we've got Nikki's favorite tree. <laughs> we just thought we'd stop in the shade and reminisce about the fact that we were here. Oh, I've made myself sad now. Okay, we won't think about that. The Balanites tree. This is probably the biggest torchwood on Juma. It is such a stunning tree. Oh, a lovely message from a viewer. And Karen, who is watching in Sacramento, which is apparently an awesome place to be. My parents have been there. I haven't managed to get there yet. But Karen has been an addict of Safari Live since Big Cat Week, but hasn't actually sent through any comments until today. Karen, it's an absolute pleasure. We're glad that you enjoy all that we can bring you. It's our greatest pleasure is to be able to share the love of the place that we live in and love ourselves. And to be able to share it with viewers across the world is one of those really special things. But Karen, you were saying, wouldn't we love to see a grizzly bear live in the wild? Absolutely. There are all kinds of wonderful magical potentials that I think we've all considered. Imagine filming wolves hunting live or tigers moving through the jungle live. There's just so many possibilities for us to consider. One day, but Karen, you have to just keep asking all of your friends and tell all your friends about a Safari Live. In the meantime, James's little elephant calf is up to mischief. Let's have a look. Well, 
I don't know how much mischief it's up to, but it's certainly up to some interesting play behavior. Now, I imagine that life for an elephant must be pretty boring. I mean, all you do is walk around the place trying desperately to find enough to eat, especially during the course of a drought. Now, what I've found with the young bulls especially is when you drive up, it's almost like they are relieved for some kind of distraction from the endless search for green food to eat. And they come up to the vehicle and have a look and then maybe spend a little bit of time interacting slowly with you. And then they have to get on with the process of finding more food to eat. And I think it's the same for that little calf who doesn't have any playmates, still too young. In a larger herd, it would, might have some playmates. And certainly these youngsters here around it will start to play with it once it gets a little bit older. But for now, it's just mum. And mum is desperately trying to find enough to eat during the course of this drought in order to f make enough milk to feed the little one there. And so I think having a car around must be quite an entertaining thing. It's right, it keeps turning and looking at us and holding his ears out. See, just like that. <laughs> Hello, Heidi, in Las Vegas. I must just tell you that in Las Vegas at the moment, there's a tournament of the newest Olympic sport, which is, of course, debuting at the Olympics this year, and that is the sport of rugby sevens. Great game, that is. Uh, Heidi, there's a tournament in Las Vegas at the moment. Go down and watch it once we've finished our safari. Um, you want to know about why, how these elephants keep this little one safe? You thought safety came in numbers. Heidi, it does come in numbers to a certain extent, but for an elephant, size is its greatest protector. And so lions and hyenas in this area, which would be the only things that could possibly take on an elephant this side, will be very nervous of taking on a mother um, with a little baby like this. She will do some serious damage to a lion or a hyena if she got hold of it. Those would be the only two predators that would think about attacking a little baby like this. And we did have an incident, excuse me, we had an incident a little while back at Arethusa where a very new calf was set upon by about 16 hyenas and the herd beat them off. I mean, they eventually gave up and went away. So there is a risk absolutely but it's not so much the numbers as the size of the elephants that will put off the predators that's not always the case i mean in this particular area it's highly unlikely to find predators with a, having killed an elephant it's much more likely in botswana and in other places where elephants have to migrate large distances to get to sufficient water and grazing then you find them that in very weakened states and their predators, especially lion prides in Savuti, for example, will specialize in killing weakened elephants or elephants weakened by drought or the dry season. But out here, not so much. I've never actually seen it. In 10 years that I've been working in and around this area, um, I've seen one or heard of one elephant kill, and that was hyenas, and they took out a very crippled four-year-old elephant. There they go. Let's just watch them. I wonder if they're not going to decide to go off and have a drink now. <laughs> All right, we're going to watch these elephants for a little bit longer, but let's head across to Jamie. She looks, sounds like she's got something quite amusing to show you. A secret to tell you all and we'll have to keep it just between us but when I came around this corner and saw the buffalo on the termite mound I initially thought it was an elephant which is one of those terribly embarrassing moments in my life that do occasionally happen you automatically see something at a certain height and your brain fills in the spaces and sometimes it fills in those spaces very very incorrectly now this is interesting. This is a very large, a giant oh, buffalo herd. Perhaps I should call James on the Game Drive channel and tell him that there is a giant herd of buffalo. And James once got very overexcited in term, when he saw a breeding herd of buffalo for the first time in the wild and called out over the Game Drive channel that there was a giant herd of about 100 buffalo moving through. But this is interesting because I think these buffalo have been somewhere around here the whole time. 
And as our regular viewers know, there's nothing lions like to do better than follow behind buffalo herds and wait for the opportunity. And you never say never, even though it's been incredibly hot this morning, there is a distinct chance that if the Inkahumas were hungry, they might have decided to have a go at one of the younger sub-adult calves of this herd. We've seen them do it before. Definitely not an impossibility. Now that, I think, has changed the, ball, the game for this afternoon. We'll be trying to at least monitor the movements of this buffalo herd. I'm not going to stay with them the whole time, but I'm going to loop around towards the back and see if I can't find the Inkahumas. The reason that buffalo has wandered up onto the top of the termite mound over there is there's a couple of reasons. One is that there's quite often more nutritious grass to be found, grass and trees, on the tops of termite mounds because the termites have brought nutrients up from the lower levels of the soil. Well, the grass that grows there sometimes is a little bit more nutritious, but also it gives her a nice vantage point to look out and look for any threats that might be ahead of them. They definitely don't have the best eyesight of any of the animals out here, but they do have a very, very solid sense of smell. They'll probably carry on walking into the wind, make sure that they smell any kind of predator. The other nice thing about herds of buffalo like this, and this is actually a giant herd, uh, I would guess at at least 250, probably more, I'd say 300, 400. They're all looking in okay condition. She looks absolutely fine. There are a couple of skinny buffalo wandering around, but most of them, ah, that's what I was looking for. There we go. I've seen a few of them, but I haven't really managed to get them on live yet. There is one brand new wobbly little calf just ahead of us. And I'm gonna try and see without startling the herd, if we can get a view of him. A little bit of a delay. As far as I can tell, look, I've never worked in the Saabi sands at this time of year before. But my general experience with buffalo is that their calves, you start seeing the first calves sort of around December or so. I'm still looking for him, sorry, Jandra. I definitely saw him somewhere in here. But I haven't spotted him yet. Very large buffalo herd wandering through. Yes, my general experience with buffalo calves is that you start to see the first ones in sort of around December. He is, mm, there he is, Jandre, coming through now at the back, just behind the aerial. Here you go, little tiny wobbly thing, well done. <laughs> Welcome to the world, little one. Not going to be an easy year ahead for you, for you or your mom. I don't want to move forward too much more. I think we'll startle the whole herd. And if I'm quiet for a moment, you can actually hear the rustling and the nibbling of the herd moving through. It's not a subtle thing, this number of buffalo. wandering through. And we saw that female up on the termite mound wandering up sure-footed and pretending to be an elephant. Only to me though. Alice watching in Ohio is looking at the buffalo on the termite mound and was wondering whether animals made her wonder whether or not animals ever actually get vertigo. Alice, I don't think so, but I'm not entirely sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a possibility that some elephants could get vertigo. It'd be awful if you were a giraffe and had vertigo. That would really suck. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I've never thought about it before. Imagine being a bird with vertigo. That would be even worse than being a giraffe with vertigo. I've often spoken before about hardy dars and the way that they call as they're flying and that wah sound that they make. And I've always been told that that was because they're terrified of heights. So you never know. <laughs> flying along. I'm <laughs> looking at me like I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buffalo. I'm being a hardy dog, can't you tell? All right, buffs. No, my hardy dog impression didn't do very well. A tough crowd. It's a tough crowd, apparently, this morning, uh, this afternoon. 
nice opportunity to just have a look at the different sizes. It's a stunning mixed breeding herd. They all look to me like they're in fairly good condition. The hip bones are starting to peak out. And of course, the poor buffalo, like the elephants, also having to cover enormous distances at the moment to get to the food that they need. Luckily, there's quite a bit of greenery about. It's far greener here than when I left to go on leave 10 days ago. So far, only one little baby. I'm fairly certain that the drought has something to do with that. They don't have a set breeding time, like Impala, where most of the lambs are born around the similar week or two at the end of the year. And generally, their births are spread all the way from December across to April. Now, my plan is to go around the back of this herd and see whether we've got any sign of the Inkahumas following them. While I do that, apparently the elephants have decided to come and pay a visit to our home. Right, the elephant there you can see is crossing the road. And Dave, will you just pan quickly to the side? And you see they're going to where we live. They've obviously decided that they have heard of the immense success and delight of the frozen cheesecake consumed today. And uh, they are wanting their own piece of it, of course, because it's much nicer than eating tannin-rich variable bush willow. Now, the cheesecake, of course, was made in honor of the fact that it is Mother's Day in the United Kingdom today. Uh, not in the rest of the world. I'm not sure why the United Kingdom celebrate their mothers on a tightly, totally different day from the rest of the world. But there it is. So if you are a mother in the United Kingdom and you're watching this, uh, well done for your achievements. And I hope your children treated you with due respect and adulation. It's quite a good word for a drought, adulation. I'm just going to talk very quietly now because we are obviously very close now, only about two and a half meters from this little baby. And the half-trunk female is moving these sticks across because there's lovely green grass underneath where they are. Isn't that cool? It's so amazing. Um, Luke in Brooklyn, nice question. Do elephants move in a purposeful fashion every day or is it just kind of a haphazard movement towards food and water? A uh, bit of both, really. Um, their movements are completely dictated by the need for food and the need for water. They will need to drink at least once a day, especially in hot conditions like this. So what that does mean is that they must move to water. Then in between those times, the older elephants will know where to try and look for food. And so they will move in some ways to specific areas that they know are rich in food. Otherwise, it will be kind of a haphazard random look. So we are now about, hmm, say, 50 meters from the entrance to our little home, 200 feet. The elephants can't get in there because there is an elephant fence there. The little one could go in, but the others will eventually get zapped on the head by a little jolt of electricity, which I can tell you from personal experience is deeply unpleasant. See how she tries to move the sticks out of the way? just to get those little bits of highly nutritious green grass. It's probably a species called Panicum, or genus called Panicum, which is a very nutritious kind of grass that the animals will seek out after some good rains. Let's just try and get into a slightly less backlit position. Hello, Tim in Arkansas. Please don't ever think that any of your questions are silly. You want to know how a lion manages to kill an elephant given the thickness of an elephant's... Oh, look at that. Look at that. 
given the thickness of an elephant's skin, exactly evidenced by what she's doing here. I'll stop here, actually, for now. Uh, Tim, it's a case of jumping on the elephant eventually and eventually exhausting it. It's a horrible thing to watch. It becomes so exhausted that it eventually collapses. And then they will try and get into the body, uh, probably much like they did with that zebra foal the other day, almost eat it alive. Um, they will have, a go have at the trunk, they'll have at the sort of soft bits at the back end and try and get into the carcass that way. But yeah, Tim, it's, it's difficult for them to get into it. It can only be done with an elephant that is in a compromised nutritional state, already weakened and then becomes completely exhausted by the attentions of, say, nine or ten lions leaping on its back. And it would be highly unlikely that it would be a, an adult. Look at that. I mean, that is a very large tree. She's just kind of moving quietly out the way there. That would take a tow rope and a vehicle to move out the way. And the little one continues to stand there playing with little bushes, trying to make out that she's being adult about life and eating. But in actual fact, just playing, and I'm sure getting quite bored in the process. no doubt absolutely loving the greenery there. She's specifically moved that big buffalo thorn tree out of the way and the buffalo thorn's got lots of nutritious leaves on it. <laughs> She's got irritated by something. I think it was the other elephant coming up, just warning her to leave the little baby alone. Maybe feel or hear, you definitely can't feel, but maybe the sensation of hearing it uh, will help you to feel it. A lovely breeze coming in out of the southeast. That's a kind of um, prevailing wind that comes through here from the southeast. That's where our weather comes from. And it's very cooling on what is a very hot afternoon. And you know, so often we go out at this time of the day and we don't see anything because it's so hot and we drive around and the sky is bleached and it's really kind of um well it's kind of not disconcerting but it's it's not a feeling of uh, great wonder and then suddenly the light starts to soften or you come out and there's a herd of elephants doing this sort of thing just feeding and acting and just the whole magic of this place uh, takes over again and becomes such an unbelievable pleasure to be out here, even in the heat. And I love the expectation of this time of the day because we know that the sun is going to disappear shortly into the west and then the light will soften and the cool will come and that perfect evening time will settle over here. Hmm. Debbie, in Vancouver, I don't know if I can answer your question. I'm going to try and think through it, though, and if I get it wrong, please feel free, for, to, if you do know the answer, to hashtag safari live us with great haste. Debbie, you say you've read that grass stems have more water in them during the course of the evening as opposed to during the day. Um, let's just think about what happens in a plant. So during the day, the plant is using um, sunlight and carbon dioxide to create sugar or glucose and oxygen. That's what's going on inside the plant. Then at night, a plant is using um, Oh, no, hang on. The hydrogen comes from water, though. So it's using water. It's, it's using ca carbon dioxide and water to create through the using chlorophyll and sunlight. It makes sugar 
and oxygen. Then at night, it does metabolize a bit of that sugar. And I'm sure water is involved in that process. I don't know, Debbie. I'm afraid I'm going to have to tell you that I'm not sure if that is true or not. It might well be. Now, this is interesting because she's given a command. That female has decided it's time to go off. Now, there's a water hole just around the corner here. The Galago pan is just over there. And I wonder if they're not just going to head around there and have a drink, maybe. Or if she's just decided, because there's another vehicle there now, that there's too much attention around her little one, and she's going to move on. I think it might be the latter. Yeah. Oh, there's something nice to eat there that she spotted. Anyway, I think we're going to leave them now, everyone. Let's probably going to go and head up towards uh, Buffalsook Dam and see apparently the lions were found there later on this afternoon, sort of between Buffalsook Dam and Cheetah Cut Line. I'm not sure how much signal Jamie's going to have over there. She is on her way there, but let's go and try and give her a hand and see if we can't track them. Right. In the meantime, let's head across to her. She is on her way there now, and she'll give you a better idea of what's going on. on the movements of the Nkuhumas. I've been chatting to one of the landowners who was out after we finished our sunrise safari this morning, and they actually found the Nkuhumas all the way to the east of Buffelshook Dam on the Torchwood Buffelshook boundary, so right top to the north eastern corner of Juma. The mystery to me is how, without the means of some kind of a teleportation device, or wings, or secret wormholes or tunnels, how on earth the Nkuhumas managed to move from where they left tracks here to that side of the reserve without any of us picking up on their tracks in any other position. I don't understand. They must have walked down maybe one of the main roads and the tracks just got driven over by vehicle traffic. Just going to be one of those mysteries for us. And perhaps they've been taking a few lessons out of the Queen Karula's books in terms of doing interesting things with their tracks and skipping across roads without leaving any evidence of their presence. Hello, little family. <laughs> little baby in the middle. Perfect miniature of the adults. I've actually watched this crowned lapwing baby grow up. There were originally two. I'm not sure what happened to the second one. But our viewers have seen this particular youngster on and off. There's either mommy or daddy watching closely. Both parents in the lapwing family are very much involved in the raising. There you can see the size difference and a slight difference to the shape of the head. Here comes mom at the back. And they've done well to raise their little offspring go forward a little bit. Interestingly, with lapwings, they've got a very interesting nesting technique. They build these little hollows in the ground and lay eggs that are beautifully camouflaged but completely unprotected from anything wandering through. And you have to wonder how many times they lose clutches of eggs to something wandering around, like an elephant or a giraffe or even a herd of buffalo might move through. I mean, they're not even protected under bushes. They are completely out in the open. However, if the adults do happen to be around the nest, they will very, very aggressively protect them. And I have solid memories as a child of walking through open fields at school and being dive-bombed and at one point pecked by crowned lapwings, or as I knew them then, crowned plovers, before the name changed. So they're not, a not afraid to throw their weight around when it comes to protecting their nest. And I can't imagine that that has much of an effect. <laughs> Contact calling to the other two. I can't imagine that would have much of an effect on a herd of buffalo, for example, wandering through. The other interesting thing about their nesting strategy is, unlike most of the birds that you would get in the sort of the North Americas and the European countries, where birds have to work to keep them warm, Plovers, have, plovers and lapwings have the exact opposite problem. 
actually have a problem keeping their nests cool. So rather than sit on them directly, they will stand and shade them and sometimes even go and fetch water, wet their bellies and then come back and wet their eggs so that there's a bit of a breeze and a bit of a cooling pattern moving over them. There's another little family here, also one that we're fairly familiar with. We saw them yesterday afternoon around the mud wallow. The mud wallow is already dry in the space of time between yesterday afternoon and this afternoon. 24 hours and the mud wallow is gone. Didn't help, I think, that the buffalo have been wandering through and sort of making away with half the sticky mud. But there's our little warthog family. There was a second, up. Oh, there we go. It was, I was going to say there was a second female, but she's also going to come and join this group. I'm fairly certain that both of these little piglets moving about on their knuckles belong to the larger female that you're looking at on your screen at the moment. It's so much fun to watch them imitate the adults, even at such a young age. And my absolute favorite thing about warthogs, for those of you, I've definitely mentioned it for most of the regular viewers, those little tufts of white on the piglet's cheeks are nature's way of making them seem like they've got tusks as some sort of mimicry, in a way. Definitely not terribly convincing, but meant to make them look far more intimidating than they actually are. I know a lot of you have been exceptionally concerned, and I've actually received a couple of messages asking for an update on the warthog mum that is quite quite badly ill. She's very emaciated. I'm afraid at the moment I don't have an update. I think that as far as I know, it's that female that lives around Twin Dams. I haven't seen her since I arrived back at work, but I did see the screenshots. She's not healthy, but she has managed to keep her little ones looking fairly well fed. So whatever she has obviously hasn't passed on to them. We don't know what happened to her. cute little ones moving around. And it seems as though it's become something of a baby themed a day because James has just found a baby antelope. So let's pop over there and have a look. Not so much a baby theme as a British mother's theme, I think. There is a mother kudu with two babies and a much older uh, young, young bull. You can see he's probably about He's probably pushing two years now. Now, I would have said that they were twins, even though that is massively unusual, except for the fact that there is another female just to the right of us looking, uh, at least left of us, sorry, Dave. And I think that she must be the mother of one of these little ones. Uh, she's actually quite a nice picture, Dave. If you look there, you can see her ribs. And the important part of that is not so much that she's a skinny, could do. It's just that the draft is obviously now taking its toll. She's tall, you know. She's probably about, mm, I'd say she's at least five foot ten at the at the shoulder. Now, Rusty Pipe, we had a similar question to this this morning. During a drought, you say, will people, yes, sorry, I, I must just con say that again. I am talking to somebody called Rusty Pipe. That is correct. Um, oh, look, 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 there's the little one coming up to its mum. Uh, Rusty Pipe, you want to know if animals will breed less during the course of a drought. Will they physically make a decision, perhaps, to breed less or have an unconscious physiological response? Rusty Pipe, I think what happens is that once animals become nutritionally compromised, their chances of carrying a fetus to term and therefore producing a baby are reduced. Their chances of producing sufficient milk to suckle and nurse a youngster obviously are reduced at the same time. Will they not breed because conditions are adverse? I don't know if that would happen or not. I mean, I assume that um, you know, if it was really bad, then obviously the females would probably not come, in, come into estrus because they wouldn't be able to lay down an endometrium that could um, take a, an embryo and therefore they might not even ovulate. And so I'm sure that would happen. I don't ever think, though, that there's a conscious decision not to breed because conditions are 
um, adverse. So I think it's probably purely physiological, and I'm sure that there are lots of physiological reasons during a drought for why uh, breeding might be reduced. A lot of them, however, to do with um, sort of infant mortality, perhaps a spontaneous abortion of fetuses if in really compromised females, and I think that's probably what happens. But I don't think they make the decision not to have babies. Rebecca, nice question. While we're sitting here, David and I um, staring straight into the soon-to-be setting sun, you want to know how much the temperature drops by the time the evening comes. Um, well, the coldest temperature it will get to probably at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning is about 22 degrees Celsius, which, if I am not mistaken, is roughly 67 or so, 67 around there Fahrenheit. And then it's 34 now, about the, as hot as, as it's been during the course of the day. And we know that that is 92 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite a drop, but not quite like, um, I think it probably drops much more in the summertime, at least in the wintertime. David, she's suckling there, you see that? I was right, that is a mother. No, no, not that's a mother. <laughs> that one's got horns. It ain't gonna be suckling anyone. There we go. That one was just having a little bit of a suckle. The baby's looking pretty good, Nick, I must say. They don't look to be in bad, Nick. So although that female is starting to look a bit ropey, that's probably a bit rough, she's just starting to look a bit skinny. The youngster looks good, and I think the Karula's kill was exactly the same age as one of these kudu. Now, Deborah, while we're looking at these antelope, magnificent ones, armchair traveler that you are, you say that you have been privileged to see eight species of antelope here and a ninth, the fleeting glimpse of the sable antelope on that most beautiful infrared image of a sable antelope that we had crossing over the Juma Dam. Dam. <coughs> uh, Dam for what is uh, no Never mind. Sorry. Um, Deborah. What I want to say is I think you've seen them all. I'm just going to quickly run through them while we look at that kudu and the oxpeckers eating the ticks off her back. So we've got the spiral-horned antelope, the kudu, the nyala, the bushbuck. Then we've got impala. We've got the dwarf antelope, the diker, and the steenbok. So that takes us to six. And then, of course, we have, well, maybe a sable. So that'll take us to seven. And then what are the other two that are water buck we've got? And I don't know if you counted wildebeest perhaps as an antelope. That might be the ninth, or am I leaving one out? I think that's pretty much it. So Deborah, give us your list. Send us through your list. That would be fascinating, actually. I, I don't know if you've counted wildebeest as a, here it comes. It has been sent through. There's a little one showing us its athletic skills. Right, let's carry on down the road. We'll wait for Deborah's list. It's on its way through. Kudu, Nyala, Waterbuck, Bushbuck, Wildebeest, Impala, Steenbok, Diker, and Sable. So those, they are, you did count, oh, sorry, excuse me. I'm very rude, my glasses on. Um, it's just so bright. Deborah, you did count the wildebeest as a or as one of the antelope, so that's fine. It certainly sits somewhere between a bovid and an antelope, so I'm happy with that. So nine, and I don't think there are any more. Yes, sable sometimes. Yes, maybe an eland, as we've seen an eland once or twice in the Sabi sands. And I mean, if you were really, really lucky, you might see a sesame. Uh, that was that would be highly unlikely. Um, and also, you might. Mm, you, might, oh, you will, I tell you what, you would see in the south, there is a reed buck. You definitely see a reed buck in the south. Sometimes, along the rivers, in the flay, is what we call a flay, which I suppose would be called a, a wetland, I guess, would be a flay, a kind of inundated area of long grass. You might find a reed buck in there. 
And then elsewhere in the Kruger, other lovely antelope species, sometimes roan. They're a particularly beautiful thing. They look like a brown sable, a little bit larger. And then you might find a sesame, like I say, or a hartebeest, which are two sort of relatively closely related antelope to the wildebeest, I guess. Um, you might find a Sunni at Pafuri, way up in the north, I think. Oh, and you'll also find a, a Sharps Chreisbok in the Mapani felt. They're quite common in the Mapani areas. And I think that's probably about all the antelope species that we get out here. Jamie's got something to show you. Uh, I think of an aquatic nation. Oh, no, you can't go to her. She's got black screen. Uh, that's not very entertaining black screen, really, is it? All right, our plan is to head down here, Twin Dams, and then we're going to head to the eastern side of the reserve. Someone has checked uh, Brown Buffalo's Hook Dam. They have found no sign of the lions. I find it very strange that those lions should have been around there. They obviously walked far during the course of the day. A herd of buffalo is off to the east west of us here. Why why they would have left that herd of buffalo when it seems that they actually followed them onto the reserve, I don't know. So that's quite an interesting story. We're going to look out for their tracks and see what we can find. There's a hornbill. Two hornbills. Much easier to keep a mammal list, I feel, than a, a bird list until you try and work out what bat species you're seeing. Then it's impossible. Completely impossible. Tom, you said your Liechtenstein's hard to be as ever wander into Sabi sands. Tom, I think you'll find they're used to. Again, they're one of these antelope that like to leave their babies away from water in the long grass like a sable and a roan. And so the chances of them coming into this area with all of the pumped water is highly, highly unlikely. And that, of course, has been one of the great big cont controversial and um, I think interesting discussion points around ecology, especially on private land is that the amount of water that has been pumped, and as I said, because everybody who's got a piece of land wants to have some water because then they've got water in front of their camp and animals will come and have a drink. But what it has done is substantially reduced the biodiversity of mammals in the area because some like to be near water, some like to be away from water, in fact, have to be away from water because their youngsters uh, need to be hidden in long grass away from predators. And that's why we don't get sable here anymore. And I mean, sable at one stage in the side Sands before it became a sort of commercial ecotourism area used to be shot for rations to feed laborers. That's how many there were here. So instead of um, culling impala to feed people, they would be shot, uh, they'd shoot sable. Isn't that unbelievable? Now you see one every so often. They're, they are bred in great number, of course, around the place for game sales. Luke, a very uh, astute question. Is there a difference between an antelope and a gazelle? Uh, there's a subtle difference, Luke. Um, physiologically, I'm not sure that I could tell you exactly what that was, but they do come from a different family. Uh, but very similar physiology. Uh, they are ruminants. And the only gazelle we get in South Africa is the springbok. And up in East Africa, of course, quite a few gazelle species. But otherwise, they're almost precisely the same. I think, if I'm not mistaken, all gazelle females also have horns. But I stand corrected on that. So it's still rather beastly hot at the moment. Hoping it'll cool down. I'm sure it will. Now, Mimi, you are just 16 years old and you want, or 15 years old, Mimi, you want to know where you find oryx. Oryx are desert species, much like the springbok, which I just mentioned. Uh, they like to live in very dry areas. They have incredible adaptations for dealing with massively dry and hot weather. Their body temperatures can, they can allow them to rise to levels that you and I would definitely have heat stroke at. Uh, same with the springbok. 
and they're found in desert areas, the Kalahari and the Namibia and the Namib Desert and all the way around there. So that's where you'd find an oryx. And I mean, if you, if you Google oryx, I guarantee you the picture you'll see is that iconic one of an oryx standing in front of those massive red dunes at Sosus Flay in Namibia. Wonderful, wonderful picture. Just quickly before we go across to Jamie, she was talking about the sick warthog. Here she is. And they're eating elephant dung. This is what buff, this is what they do sometimes. No, oh, this is just a sad thing to see. She doesn't seem to be getting any better either. They're eating elephant dung. Warthog will often eat elephant dung because, of course, there's still lots of nutrition in elephant dung. Much of that dry material within the elephant dung is undigested and therefore or partially digested and so pretty healthy. They're not eating elephant dung now, they're actually grazing. But you can see she is in a bad way. The little one is still fine. All right, Jamie's got some slightly less distressingly nutritionally compromised ill warthogs. Let's go across to them, they're a bit more cheerful. Very sad sight that you got to see with James. And I thought I'd just stop to give you a nice, healthy warthog family to mitigate the distress of that sighting a little bit. We've got two very happy, healthy little ones and a very healthy mom as well. Amazing to see them already acting completely as adults would. So at only a couple of months old, and I mean, I'm guessing, I'm not a world expert in aging warthogs, but their tusks start to appear at six months. They're a little bit younger at this stage. No, no sign of the tusks coming through. Now I'm guessing that these guys are about two, three months old and already fairly much reliant on solid food rather than having to use the resources of their mom and suckle. And you find with all of the herbivore animals that the offspring very often wean far faster than something, for example, like a hyena or a leopard or a lion. They learn to stand on their own four trotters much faster. And that's good news for the two little ones of that sick mommy warthog, because if she does die, there's still a chance that those little ones could survive. And as I said, they, to see them imitating the natural adult behavior, which includes, come on, little one, please, please cooperate. Are you going to go down? <laughs> no. But Dolly was watching our earlier sighting and wondering about or how interesting it is that they go down on their, their knuckles and was wondering why they do that. So although they are predominantly herbivores, they do like to go and snuffle down to the root system. And I think that going down onto their knuckles it's just an adaptation to get their noses and their mouths closer to the roots and the shoot system that they're trying to get to, the more nutritious aspects of the plant. There we go. Thank you, little one. Very convenient of you. So Dolly, it just gets their heads a little bit closer. Highly entertaining to watch. They've got calluses on those knuckles that develop very quickly. So they can use them quite effectively. And then with their long, narrow, pointed heads, also brings their mouths closer down towards the food source. You'll probably find, Dolly, that there's also an adaptation in terms of the way that they use their snouts to dig up roots, as well as the way that their teeth are positioned and the way that they use their lips to pull up shoots. All aspects that would have evolved together as they reached the form that they're in now. Yeah, you can see her nipple's still extended between her back legs, so she's still suckling. Nice to see two healthy, or a healthy family. I was going to tell you something, and it's completely gone. Oh, I remember what I was going to talk about. So I was thinking about the tusks that grow through, and I was actually thinking about it in the context of elephant babies but I was just wondering we know that when elephants start to grow their teeth it itches and makes them a little bit sore just like with toddlers teeth. I oh, hello zebra. Lots of zebra around at the moment. I think pushing in from Kruger to find fresh grazing opportunities. Just looks like 
a solitary stallion. I don't see any others. There's a couple of stallions that move along our northernmost boundary. But yes, back to the teething. So warthog tusks. Yeah, actually, in a reposition, I think we'll be able to get a clearer view. And the nice thing about this particular family is they're also very comfortable with cars. So warthog tusks are teeth. They're modified in sizes, just in the same way elephant tusks are. And I wonder whether warthog babies also get that sort of teething-like stage, where it starts to itch and burn, and whether they have any methods of or any plants that they might target. We know elephant babies often go and eat spike thorn leaves or silver cluster leaf leaves to relieve the pain and to numb the gums ever so slightly, as well as tambourtes. It would be interesting to know whether or not warthogs have any other methods or something similar that they do. Looks like two little females. One's definitely, like, oh no, it's a little male and a little female. I've seen a couple of exceptionally large warthogs in this area. And of course, we always forget, and I like the constant reminders in the form of questions from our viewers, that for looking through the camera doesn't always give you the best perspective of scale. So Roy was wondering, how tall is an adult warthog at the shoulder? And the answer is probably close to about half a meter or so, which puts it at about 20 odd inches. If I had to try and compare it, Roy, let's try it rather than using sizes, if I had to turn, compare it to one of an animal that you might be more familiar with, Roy, I'm not sure if you're in America or if you are watching in Europe, but a Staffordshire Terrier, either an American Staffy or an English Staffy, so the type, the breed of dog, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but that would be a sort of uh, a rough estimate. Maybe the warthog is slightly smaller, but some of the big males that we see would equate to roughly the size of a Staffy. If I had to pick a breed of dog to compare them to, it is something that we very often forget. But a fearsome creature for a little animal this size, not to be trifled with, and even a male leopard will think twice about tangling with an adult warthog, particularly an adult male warthog. And I know we speak a lot about this. Maybe we'll get a clear view of this female's tusks. But underneath her top tusks, she's got tushes at the bottom that are rubbed razor sharp. And as with all animals out here, they are far more powerful than you expect them to be. We spoke about the buffalo's eyesight, and Jim is wondering a little bit about the warthog's eyesight and how far they can see, whether or not their eyesight is very good. In my experience, they are exceptionally keen-eyed. They usually have spotted you from far, long before you've spotted them. But they do have relatively keen eyesight. As with most of the animals out here, they're equally reliant upon their sense of smell and their sense of hearing as well. You always, um, you, a lot of textbooks mention that, for example, that antelope species don't have the best eyesight of the animals. And I've, in my experience, I have seen them spot animals like cheetah or leopard long before I even realized that they were there. Makes sense that they have good eyesight. You need to be able to see a threat coming I don't have the protection of a large herd like a buffalo might, so a buffalo can get away with having poor eyesight. Look at that face. Part of the, the ugly five, I believe. Perhaps a grossly unfair description. I don't think they're terribly ugly. Okay, they're not the most attractive animals out here. You could maybe use a, a spa session. A little bit of anti-wrinkle cream might not go astray. They're really not that ugly, I think, personally. But yes, the ugly five, including the leopard-faced vulture, the marabou stork, the warthog, the spotted hyena, and there's one other desperately trying to think of what it is. There you can see your tushes perfectly, those lower incisors. 
Now those are the tusks you don't want to mess with. It's not the ones on top, it's the ones below. And as with all members of the pig family, most of you come from areas where you'll be familiar with wild boars and the dangers that they pose. Warthogs can be equally scary when they want to be. They're, never, they're not aggressive though. They'll never set out to attack people. But if you do corner them, they are capable of explosive speeds and using those tusks as formidable weapons. Always on alert. Oh, Gracie, welcome to the Sunset Safari as always. Gracie, who is eight years old, has said that she absolutely loves when all of the animals eat together and it's almost like they are having a party. But Gracie is a little bit worried. She wants to know if the animals will fight over food is because there's not so much to go around. And Gracie, no, not yet. The only time you're really gonna see animals fighting each other is when they come to have a drink. And even then, they're very good at basically the biggest person gets to have a drink and because there's water for all of them, they'll be able to rotate through. It's just a matter of some people or some animals having to wait their turn, but they won't fight too much over food. It's really mostly only the lions that tend to seem to disagree when it comes to meal times. The rest of the animals are fairly civilized and they do enjoy their party. Now one animal that we even refer to as having a party, Gracie, is birds. So different species of birds move around together in what's known as a feeding party. And that's because they're going for the same food, but they don't fight over it, but there's lots of different eyes to keep an eye out for any kind of a threat. So that's a bird feeding party. And we'll always keep an eye out for one to show you. But most of the time, the animals are happy to feed together because it means that there are lots of eyes and lots of ears and then lots of noses to smell if there's any kind of threat. And it's worth sharing your food and having that party provided so long as you can keep an eye out for any lions or leopards that might decide to come hunting. One last look at our happy, healthy warthog family. As I mentioned before, it's, it's positive that warthog babies wean as quickly as they do. But Romy, who is watching in Ohio, is also worrying about the youngsters of that very ill female and was wondering if she were to die, would the warthogs be accepted, would the young warthogs be accepted into another family? Romy, my suggestion is that it would be unlikely. Trot, 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 mom's, mom's gone. The <laughs> sudden panic didn't realize how far mom had got away from them, distracted by feeding. Romy, I don't think that they would be, unless she happens to have a, relate, a related female around, maybe that, look, never say never. I personally don't think it's terribly likely. I think that they would be sort of forced to survive on their own, but you never say never. Warthogs do form what are known as sounders, and they don't always have to be related to each other. So the females will share a burrow. We've seen it with the warthogs on quarantine, for example, the two females that originally had six piglets. Although I have to be honest, I think the two piglets we saw earlier were the remains of that little family. But you see unrelated females forming a sounder. They've got extra eyes. Again, it helps to be in a group. But that's when two females have come together and given birth together at sort of a similar time. I don't see a likely scenario with warthogs babies coming in and then being adopted. But you never know. Stranger things have happened. OK, I think I'm going to leave our warthogs. They're slowly moving off the block. In theory. <laughs> and as we leave our warthog, one final question coming through from Luke and his newly wedded wife, Letitia. They're watching in Brooklyn, New York. They were Brent's guests 
at the very start of Brent and myself's leave, and we had a wonderful time. Luke, it was wonderful to meet you as well. I'm glad that you're now jumping on board and watching the safari. Luke wanted to know why, when warthogs run away, do they run with their tails in the air? So the common old wives' tale or old guides' tale that many guides will tell you is a sort of a, a joke to see how gullible you are, is that their skin is so tight that they can only do one of two. If they drop their tails, then it opens up their eyelids because they've got that tight, wrinkly, dry skin. So when they're feeding and they want their eyes open, they have their tails down. But when they're running away through thick grass and they don't want the grass seeds to go in their eyes and they want to close their eyes, they have to lift their tails because their skin is so tight. That, of course, is absolute um, drivel. I was trying to think of a polite term for that. And it's more to do with the fact that it allows hogwash. Brilliant, Louise. That is absolute hogwash. <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to take credit for that pun, but that was entirely Louise's, and I'll give her I'll give her that. Um, but yes, the reason that they do that is so that the babies and the mothers can move together. They're quite a lot lower than most of the antelope. All of the animals have, to a degree, a follow me strategy, so a way of keeping the herd together. And in the case of the, sorry, I'm listening to the Game Drive channel at the same time. Awesome. But in the case of the warthogs, that high tail means that it's easier for babies and other individuals to follow along behind. Right. Journey of giraffe. I wonder if these are some of our friends from this morning. We had nine giraffe this morning on quarantine, which is the largest number I've ever seen while I've been conducting these live safaris and on Juma in particular. Nice young male, feeding away. Look at the way he's twisted his neck around to get to those leaves. There's also an elephant in the back somewhere there. I'm sure I saw it. That's what the giraffe keep looking at. One, two, three, four, five. looking at one of nature's leaf eaters, which brings me to Kathy's question in Tennessee. Kathy just wants a little reminder as to the correct term for an animal that eats leaves rather than grass, uh, predominantly leaves. And as with giraffe or kudu, for example, they are known as browsers. So browsers eat leaves, grazers eat grass, as you suggested. They are moving in quite dense vegetation. There's the elephant there, just in case you didn't believe me. There you go. A big grey shape hidden in the bushes. Probably, probably the same male that we saw this morning as well. They were on their way in this direction. Elephants, as opposed to being grazers or browsers, are mixed feeders. And their diet very much varies from season to season. It's safe to say at this time of year, usually they would be feeding on a great deal of grass. Unfortunately for them now, there is hardly any grass for them to feed on and they're not gonna spend too much time trying to get to the nice little green shoots. But we're gonna see more and more elephants targeting trees. And in fact, you'll actually be able to see, there'll probably be a visible effect in terms of the vegetation of this area because of the drought. The elephants are gonna start targeting areas of dense vegetation, they might even start targeting different tree species and really start to open up these thicker woodland areas. And that is all part of the natural way that this ecosystem has evolved with a species like an elephant that is capable of actually changing the face of the environment that they live in. In a couple of years, in a restricted system, which fortunately we are not in at the moment, we're in a nice open system, four million hectares of area, but in a more restricted system, they can actually convert a woodland to grassland. Our giraffe are playing fairly hard to get in this bright, bright light, 
and I believe I've been listening sort of with half an ear to the Game Drive channel and James has been conversing about some vultures. So I think let's jump onto the back of his vehicle and find out what he's been chatting about. Now there's some interesting things going on here, everybody. There are lots of vultures around. We've just seen a whole lot of them take off. And one of the guys from Bufflesook came in, he's over there, and he drove in here to have a look to see because we're quite close to where they thought the Inkahuma Pride was. And what you can feel as you watch your picture is that we're falling into holes. Now these holes have been largely dug by uh, Artfuck, and just around one of the Artfuck burrows, this chap found a dead warthog. It looks like a young warthog, and we're just gonna go and have an investigation and see what's happened. And there seem also to be lots of vultures around. I'm sure they're looking to try and come and eat this thing. And I'll be very interested to know how or why the warthog died. Of course, we do know that warthog are in one of the most vulnerable creatures when it comes to a drought. just very kindly moving out of the way for us and we'll have a look see over here hi ah, yeah. ah yes I see thank you very much now there is the expired pig you see it there Dave and interestingly, the stink, of course, is absolutely unspeakable because it has not been dead recently. Now, let us try and work out perhaps what happened here. Lots of warthog, uh, at least lots of artifact burrow around the place, so lots of ant bears that come through this area, obviously. And then I think a whole lot of uh, vultures have actually just taken off. We saw them fly off us. But there's one more, Dave, just in front of us there. A huge vulture. And if you see a vulture ever in a tree that has got leaves on it, you can be pretty sure that it is looking, sitting above something that it wants to eat. Now, that is the most common vulture we get here, the white-backed vulture. So named because it has a white back. So I'm going to get out of the car now. I'm pretty sure there are no predators around. And we're just going to have a quick look. I'll tell you what I can see, and then I'll get back in, and we'll have a look, see exactly why we think this warthog passed on, Mo shook off this mortal coil, kicked to the bucket, expired. Can you hear me, David? Yes. Oh, good. Right. Now, so what we do at a scene of a crime like this is look around for tracks of predators. Plenty of vulture tracks here. I'm not worried about frightening the vulture, frightening the vulture off. Oh, it's not a warthog. It's not a warthog at all. It's an artfark that's died. This is incredible. If it wasn't so utterly stinky, I'd grab it. I'm gonna move the car so you can get a better look at it. Let's have a look, see. It's not a warthog. It is an unusual, deeply unusual animal, and I know, I mean, they're, they're not uncommon here. We just don't see them because they're out so late at night. And while looking at a dead animal is not particularly exciting, uh, seeing one that is so rare is magnificent. All right, there we go. Let me get out and point out the interesting bits to you. I just need a stick so that we can move it about a bit. Now, whenever I find an animal like this and there isn't an obvious predator around, I mean, leopard will kill Artfark, but they will normally then put them into a hole. So I don't think that's what's ha killed this one. Um, what's interesting here is that whenever I see something like this, my immediately th thought is snake. Uh, maybe a snake bit it. Uh, this one is long dead, and what I want to try and do is expose its head so we can have a look there. <laughs> but it's an extremely heavy creature. <laughs> this, is, this is a dis distinctly distasteful activity. I'm going to need something heavier than that. Um, David, if, 
Louise wants to link away while we do this, so tell her that's okay. But otherwise, we can carry on looking. Um, this is a very smelly job, but I just want you to see its head, if possible. No, maybe not. I think a spade would be, would be better employed. Anyway, there it is, the artfark. It's a very solid, very heavy animal. So let's go across to Jamie. I'm going to try and sort of excavate a little bit, and we'll see if we can't get a better look at it when you come back to us. Well, that is truly fascinating, and I hate to take you from one dead artifact to one dead praying mantis, but that is just the way that the drive has gone. But I just had to show you this extraordinary marvel of nature. Isn't she... Oh, I don't want to block out the sun. Isn't she beautiful? That's me moving the canvas, by the way, that's causing her movement. I actually found her, or Jandre found her, on my binoculars. There you can see those incredible long arms. If you look really carefully, you might... Uh, <laughs> I want to point at things, but I can't, and I don't think I have a stick. But you can actually see the slight claws and the slight protrusions on those. There you go. You can see the serrations on the legs. And then this incredible abdomen. I'm just going to turn it over slightly. Here we go. Oh, turn a little bit. The way that her body is looking like a leaf. Ah, I've blocked the sun out, which isn't really what I want to do. Absolutely stunning. And I'm sorry if I'm slightly distracted. I'm actually going to turn it off. There's, um, there's very much a conversation about the cricket game that was happening, going on in my ear through the in-game drive comms. So I'm sorry if I lost my train of thought there, but apparently somebody made a magnificent catch um, right above his head with arms stretched right up. That's what has just come through in my ear. <laughs> but yes, she is beautiful. I was just chatting a little bit about the parasites that you find within the... She's now stuck to my finger. Um, please detach yourself, my dear. There we go. Talk a little bit about the parasites that are contained in these abdomens. Now, it's not always the case, but a lot of the time, they actually have what are known as horsehair worms. And you'd be surprised. I've, I've seen it a couple of times with dying praying mantises when the worms decide to actually jump ship. Now, I'm talking about worms that if, could probably be about twice the length of her body. And they're very, very tiny, and they're thin, and they're packed inside the abdomen of these insects. And it's crickets and mantids that I've seen it the most in. And what happens is they slowly start to poison the brain of the host, because they are, of course, parasites, that eventually cause the animal to try and drown itself, because the worms reproduce in water. So they get the host species to jump in water. Make, I don't know if it's a way that they do it by making them incredibly thirsty, but they essentially drown themselves and then reproduce in that environment. So fascinating, definitely one of nature's grossest parasites. I must say, even for me, and I've got a fairly strong stomach, I found them a little bit distasteful, especially when you see the amount of them that can be packed into an animal like this, this abdomen. Look at her eyes. I'm not sure how well you can see them. Duck down. Oops, sorry. My big head in the way. See the shining eyes and then the incredibly sensitive antenna. Mantids, of course, famous. There you can see her pupil there. Mantids, famous, of course, for the female's slightly distressing habit of consuming her mate after mating, providing her body with the necessary nutrients. I think that. In general, we're fairly grateful that that is not a technique that's been adopted by all species. You can see the way her legs are curled up under her. I'm not sure why she died. It might have just been a natural death that she ended up on my binoculars. But a beautiful specimen. To give you a sense of scale, I'll just put my finger behind her. She's about, oh, she's about the length of my finger from tip to knuckle. A really stunning little insect. Okay, I think I'm going to keep her. I'm going to see and try and see if I can identify 
which particular species this happens to be. There are lots of different types. In the meantime, let us return to Detective, what would we call him, CSI Henry, Detective Henry, De Chief Constable Henry, and find out how his investigation of that crime scene is going. What's interesting here, of course, we've pulled this thing out. We've pulled it out, and I did this with gloves on. So for young viewers, just understand that this is done not by hand. Um, it can be, well, it's just, you know, there are a lot of bacteria and pathogens that will exist on a carcass this old. It doesn't smell very nice. It is starting to rot. So I put some gloves on, and we pulled it out by the tail, and then flipped it over. And I don't know what killed it, but what's interesting that it was, it was buried all the way up to here. It was buried all the way up to this part of the body in the sand. Now, I can't see any obvious signs of injury, um, a couple of scratches there, but I mean, you know, this stage of decomposition, it really is difficult to tell. So my, I have two top suspects here. One is a leopard that came through here, grabbed it, maybe bit it, decided it was too much or injured it so badly. And that's why it was head first into the sand trying to get away. An animal like this can dig faster than a human being can with a spade. So if you come after it, if you come after an artifact like this and you're trying to kill it, it will dig itself underground faster than you can dig after it. So that's unbelievable. So maybe it was threatened, it got half way under the ground and was so severely injured that it died before it could carry on. My other suspect is always something like a black mamba. They are obviously particularly venomous snakes and quite possibly what killed this. A black mamba is not nearly big enough to eat or an artifact like this and so it would have been left alone and then devoured by the vultures and that's what will happen for the rest of the time that the carcass is around. Just a couple of things to note. The big ears, obviously, very characteristic. The long snout, like that, which is used, it's got a very long tongue in it, which it will be used to probe into uh, ant, ant nests. They eat a lot of ants, they eat a lot of termites. And then, of course, the most obvious things about this thing are its claws. Look at its claws here. And that, if you ever see an artifact track, you will see those three claws in the sand. Those are the most obvious things that you will see uh, if you ever track an artfark uh, when you see them crossing the road. This, this back claw doesn't seem to make it, but those nails are, I mean, they're an inch long, and they are incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, and that's what this animal will use to dig into the ground to get into these burrows and then to get into and underneath the ant nests and that sort of thing. Fascinating, very sad to see it in this state. Obviously, I don't think there's anything nefarious that went on here. I think this is perfectly normal. Uh, kind of natural death, either from predator or snake, which is totally natural and normal. So, interesting stuff. And uh, vulture, vulture feathers, obviously, they've been squabbling and fighting over this kill. So, there we go. Unfortunately, dead Artfark. But you can see the size of them, probably about three feet from um, tip to tail. Very powerful shoulder muscles here. You can see incredibly powerful for digging. And lots of right, pretty attractive regal flies on it, but disgusting stink coming off here. And I think that's quite enough of this disgusting stink. I will remove these gloves very carefully and we will then press on to fairer climbs. So if you are ever in the wilderness and you find something like this, a pair of gloves like these, of course, are very useful because you don't really want to have anything to do with that on your bare skin. Right, we'll push that to the bottom of the car and continue. Amazing, David. Have you ever seen an artifact before? Never. Let me just, sorry, wrong way. Get on this way. Just amazing. Okay. Thankfully, we do carry a first aid kit, and the first aid kit has a number of gloves in it. And plug myself back in. And I think we'll make out our way out of this rather somber sighting and see what else we can find. There we go. On we go. Just see if I can hear Louise. There we go. I can hear her. 
Hello, Tom in Dallas. Do I think it could have been anthrax? Um, I truly hope not. I don't want to have anything to do with an anthrax animal. Uh, I think it's really unlikely, Tom. I don't think it's quite dry enough yet. And, well, I mean, it's not impossible, I suppose. But I don't think so. It's certainly something to think about. I, th I think it was probably a snake. There hasn't been an anthrax outbreak here for some time. But we are going into a drought, so it's not impossible. And Marianne, you reckon maybe a snake bite, you suspect possibly also a snake bite. Anyway, fascinating, fascinating stuff. You say, since we were so very kind to allow you to count the dead honey badger on your critter list, can you use the dead artifark? Maggie, I think until we, such time as we are able to take you on a drive after 10 o'clock at night, you can absolutely count the dead artifark as one of your, <laughs> one of your critters. <laughs> One day when we're able to take you out on a, on a very late night drive, you can take it off until we see a living one. Yeah, and I mean, um, I, I think you're all saying that you're shocked at how large an artifark is. Yeah, they're not small. They're very big. Very large animals and heavy. I mean... <laughs> It took, it, it wasn't easy hauling that thing out of the ground, I have to tell you. So, I mean, probably weighs, I don't remember what they weigh, I think probably weighs in the region of 25 kilograms when it is a whole as opposed to half eaten. 25 kilograms in pounds is about 60 pounds, 60 or 65 pounds. So yeah, very heavy. And I don't think that was a particularly big one. I don't know if it was male or female. But I just want to give you an idea here. If you look over there, Dave, you can see those vultures sitting there. I suspect quite strongly that those vultures were the ones that came off the ground when we drove in there. And they are quite possibly, there you can see them there. They are quite possibly waiting there again for things to calm down there. They won't feed on the ground while we are there. They're much too threatened by us to do that. Interesting stuff. Now we need to keep an eye out for the lion tracks. Hmm. Rusty Pipe, an interesting one. Are artifark burrows a danger to elephants on the ground there? No, I don't think so. They don't go that deep, you know. Um, they're a danger to Land Rover, certainly. We've, I've many times got stuck in artifark holes. Uh, but no, I don't think they're a danger to elephants. Uh, elephants could stand around them and then sort of break them down, I guess, and then have to lift their feet out. But no, I don't think it's a real danger, not unless they were moving really fast in a panic fashion, then maybe they might be. But remember, um, something I was going to say that's not completely slipped my mind. Uh, elephants, holes, Oh, elephants are actually really good at feeling whether they can stand somewhere or not, and I think that obviously comes with being heavy. And I remember once we had uh, an elephant that used to love to come into the camp at Ngala, which was up north of here. And away from there, you'd come through this beautiful A-frame in the reception, and then you'd have to go across a narrow bridge that went across the stream. And uh, the elephant sometimes used to come in through the A-frame, right past the reception area, and then he would stop and put his feet onto, the, onto the, the bridge and kind of feel at it. This is vulture, check this vulture. It's gonna think about flying, but maybe it won't. Don't fly. You can see him thinking about flying. That's a white-backed vulture, really nice view of a white-backed vulture. And I think he's just panting. That's why his mouth is open.
anyway, what this elephant used to do was to feel and stop. It, it knew that the bridge would not support its weight, and so it wouldn't go there. Now, Alison, you want to know how many species of vulture we have in the reserve? We have a number of species. No, We've got five. Uh, that is the cricket score being read over the game drive radio, which is a particularly irksome activity. Right, um, we've got the white pack vulture, we've got the cape vulture, those are the two griffin vultures, and then we get something called a lappet faced vulture, which is the largest vulture we get. I'll show you a picture of all of these if you like. And then a hooded vulture, a white headed vulture. And those are the five species of vulture that we'd get in this area. Let me just get out my book. It flies everywhere. Nasty flies. Um, here we go. I'll just find you these vultures. I feel like I'm missing out one that might be what we call a vagrant. So have a look here, Dave. So all the, all the vultures and the eagles and the hawks are actually in a similar family, uh, in the same family. And so despite the fact they look so different, uh, they are actually quite similar. There is the white-backed vulture. We've got the white-backed, the cape, and the rupals maybe once or twice. Uh, they're very common in East Africa, but not common here. I've never seen one. And those are the griffin vultures. You can see they look a very distinctive, typical vulture look. And then the non-griffin vultures, the hooded, a, the smallest species that we see here, very spe specially designed bill for getting in amongst the bones where the others are unable to do that. Hooded vulture can't open up a carcass. What it does is it waits for the carcass to be opened up by the much heavier billed things like the lappet face down here. That is the big lappet faced vulture. And then the most uncommon, but I think most beautiful, the white headed vulture in the middle there. And those are the five or six vultures that we might get here. Then, I mean, you might be very, very lucky. Every so often, a palm nut vulture, uh, not a palm nut, an Egyptian vulture comes down every so often, and once or twice, a palm nut vulture like that. But that's very, very rare. Cool. That's the vultures. Oh, Keith, I love this question. Um, Keith, you want to know how that vulture, which is going to take off as we go past it. I don't know if you want to film it as it goes, Dave. It's definitely going to fly as we go underneath. Here we go. Get ready to track him, Dave. Keith, I'll answer your question now. You want to know how this vulture finds its food. Oh, it's not flying. It's really cool. <laughs> they never sit like this. This is awesome. <laughs> Keith, they find their food almost entirely with sight out here. And that is completely distinct from the New World vultures. So the buzzards, as you might call them. Or oh, I don't know, Keith, I'm assuming you're called, you're getting hold of us from the New World, you might not be. So the Americas, the condors and what you'd call a buzzard over there, they find their prey using smell. And they are most closely related not to these. They're not related to these vultures. They're related to storks. And they find their prey with smell because obviously they fly largely over forested areas, whereas a vulture like this flies over open woodland and therefore eyes are a better use or better way to find kills. It has got something in its mouth. Or has it? That's its tongue hanging out. That's the vulture's tongue hanging out. And the other really interesting thing about this, cool thing about this is, can you see the tree shaking? See that? It's with every... With every breath that he takes, the tree shakes slightly. Now, a vulture actually has an astonishing tongue. It's hard, and it's almost, it's almost shaped like a spatula or a spoon. So it's able to use it to scrape things, to scrape the meat. You can see there. See the shape of it there? It's not straight like ours. It's kind of um, 
grooved and rounded. I'm not sure if you're able to even see that there. Maybe a little bit. Just had a, an amazing song from Louise down the radio, which I shall not repeat. Um, I shall probably laugh when I get home, though. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. What a very beautiful song. <laughs> Clever lyrics. Every breath I take makes the treetop shake. That is the white-backed vulture. That is the least terrified white-backed vulture I've ever seen. Um, Cindy, you want to see a vulture's nest. Um, well, Cindy, that, that we do find them every so often. I don't know of one def definitively on Juma. I know of one on Arethusa, a white-backed vulture's nest. Um, all of the vultures that we get here, with the exception of the Cape vulture, are tree nesting. So they build a very unattractive platform of uncomfortable looking sticks in the top of a tree, often a knob thorn tree, and that is where they raise their chicks. But something like the Cape vulture nests in cliffs, in huge colonies in the cliffs of the Drakensberg there. And vultures are A, fascinating, and B, severely, severely under threat. We don't really understand why, except that we do know that people can sell vulture parts for traditional medicine out here. And when they do that, obviously, it becomes easy to, well, it's easy to kill a vulture because all you do is kill a cow or something like that, poison the carcass, and even if it's outside of a protected area, the vultures will go there. And I think the advent of vultures' restaurants has made that process uh, more distressing. And so poachers and people who are desperate and wanting to try and make a quick buck will poison a carcass outside the reserve. The vultures will fly out, die there, and then they can sell the carcasses of vultures to traditional healers. I think sometimes for as much as 5,000 rand, which um, these, these, these days is worth about, whew, what's, what would that be, Dave? About three or 400 dollars for one carcass, which if you don't earn anything at all, is a, a fair whack of cash. So they are in severe threat, and I am convinced that there are far fewer vultures here than when I was last in the area. And if, I mean, I, I left this area in 2010 and went away, and I am convinced that in the intervening five years, there are far, far fewer vultures than they were when I was originally here. Thank you, Lucy, in South Bend, Indiana. You say you loved Louise's lyrics. Well, that's, that's good. I, I'm, she's, she's very pleased about that. Let's go across to Jamie before I say something else. OK, bye-bye. Here's a lovely view of a giraffe that we don't often see. looking down from at the top of the Juma Dam wall onto this glorious, dark, very interestingly patterned male and his entourage of ox pickers. Beautiful in this afternoon light. For those of you who were concerned about the cricket scores, the, one of the batsmen has just gone out with the last ball of the over. I'm just going to <laughs> turn that down again. Look at that. Nice old male. We don't often get to look down on them. We're basically a little bit above his head height. Oh, what a stunning view. And this is definitely an older gentleman. Look at the scarring around his face and the way that the bones, the ridges along the center of his nose are very, very prominent. And in a male giraffe, those continue to grow throughout his life and form his primary weapon when fighting off from other males' attention. Look at those. We chatted a lot about the design of their face 
This is awesome. A lot about the design of their face and the structure of their lips and their nostrils and the way that they're adapted to feeding on thorn trees. You can see all of the hair around the edges of their lips using them as an extra sense. And there's that black tongue that can extend well over 20 inches, 50 centimeters odd. And the reason it's so dark in color is because it's impregnated with melanin, which toughens it. Melanin pigment is a very, very tough pigment. And that's what gives him the ability to munch away at a thorn tree like that without being in any way concerned. Mm, yummy. It's like dinner and toothpicks all in one. Get the level. <laughs> <laughs> Just a um, quick nostril clean at the same time. Fascinating to watch. Looking down upon this sort of a stereotypical animal of Africa in this gorgeous afternoon life. It really is a stunning sighting. Now, we're looking down on a camelopardus, to use the correct Latin name, which brings us around to Paul's question. He was wondering if giraffe are by any chance related to camels. And very well observed, Paul, yes. To an extent on the evolutionary line, they are, if you go far enough back, look at the way he's walking. Oh. In that case, look at the way he's standing, since he's not quite being as cooperative as I thought he was going to be. When he does decide to walk, not that I actually want him to, because this is a beautiful view, and you get a really nice look at the dark color of his skin. Here we go, he's gonna walk for us. Right front, right back, left front, left back. The same side, the front leg and the back leg move together. And the only other animal apart from the akapi, which of course is very much a relative of the giraffe, is a camel that walks like that. Hyenas do to an extent, but that's more due to their sloping backs. But yes, camels and giraffes walk in that manner. First the one side, then the other. And what that means for them is that for giraffe in particular, they only have two speeds. One is walking and the other is galloping. They can't trot like a zebra or a horse because they can't have both feet on both sides up in the air for an extended period of time in a fast motion like that. He really is a stunning dark color. Males tend to go darker than females, and of course, as we've spoken about before, giraffe do darken with age as a general rule. That being said, like just like people with different hair colors, different individuals have different genetic codes for the extent that they start to go dark or how dark they start off their lives as. He's a beautiful male. Stop to have a look before moving up. Oxpeckers targeting the ticks around and underneath the tail, all of those tender areas they're taking the opportunity while he defecates to catch the harder to get ticks tucked under his tail. They could definitely do him some serious service there because it must be incredibly exasperating being any kind of animal infested with ticks when you don't have thumbs or a way of reaching them. Now, before he disappears from view, I just wanted to answer Karen's question. Karen's wants to know, what are the dark lumps at the back of his head behind his ossicones? And Karen, that was very well observed. The answer to that is they're actually almost, in a way, very similar to the ossicones themselves. So giraffe, particularly males, have those ossicones or those horns on the tops of their heads as a weapon against other males. So they swing their heads around, creating tremendous momentum and whack each other on the sides, on the flanks, and on the rear, and on the legs. And that is their way of fighting for females. It's only really the males that you see do it. And 
To add to the weaponry of the ossicones, so the horns on the top of the head, they also have protrusions around their skulls so that the impact is greater. So around the middle of the nose, so the ridge in front of the ossicones, and then two protrusions at the back so that no matter what angle they whack the other male giraffe at, they still have a possibility of doing some damage. And that's actually, believe it or not, the predominant theory as to why giraffe have evolved to have long necks. So most of the, or the originally accepted idea was quite simply that it allowed them a feeding advantage. But look at how he's feeding now. Look at how low down he's targeting the leaves. And in fact, evolutionary scientists and biologists have started to think, even with the dinosaurs that had long necks, that it was more as a reproductive strategy that they started to evolve longer and longer necks. Just like a kudu have evolved nice long curly horns. It's a similar strategy. It just takes a little bit of wrapping our minds around that because it's so contrary to what most of us, I would think, have, been, have grown up to believe. Up he goes, walking left. Uh, every time I say he's walking, he stops. <laughs> disappeared behind the bush. I wonder what that stomp was about. Probably an ox picker that just was irritating him a little bit. As the evening starts to draw to a close, this gentleman, along with the rest of the journey of giraffe that have been moving through this area, will have to find a place to spend the evening. And Simon was asking, how do giraffe sleep? And the answer to that, Simon, is that they actually, they do lie down. They lie down, they fold their legs up underneath themselves, and they actually get down in a way very, very similar to camels, to go back to the original observation about the relationship between camels and giraffe. But they lie down, but they never put their heads down. And that's because they can't. With the way that their blood vessels and their hearts are constructed to keep the blood flowing against the flow or against the pull of gravity up to the brain and then not flowing down too fast down the vein system back towards the lungs and the heart, they're adapted in a way that means they can't actually put their heads down. Not just that, but the neck has got a very, very thick tendon that runs down the back of it. So in fact, a resting position for a giraffe is with its head upright. And to lower the head, they actually have to contract their muscles. It's like bats. Bats have a naturally closed position with their feet and they actually have to contract their muscles to open their hands so that they don't have to think about holding on when they sleep upside down. Giraffe neck is exactly the same. It's held up by that tendon. So they'll sleep like that. They don't sleep as we do. So they might have a couple of deep sleep cycles, but they're very, very brief. Most of their little napping moments are done as sort of cat naps of about 20 minutes or so. And that's because sleep out here means you're not being vigilant. And if you're not being vigilant, particularly if you're a large animal lying on the ground, you are almost instantly at th under threat. So they don't sleep for long periods, extended periods of time as we do. And in fact, a lot of people are saying that in fact, as human beings, it's only recently that we've started to develop these long eight, six to eight hour stretches that we spend asleep. He's vanished off, probably to go and find some more dinner before he decides to go and lie down somewhere in some nice dense bush. They can also sleep standing up, by the way. They don't just have to lie down. I'm going to make my way across to the hyena den. While I do that, let's find out if Mr. Henry has, uh, has amazing things to show you. Well, there's a very attractive sight. Some lions lying on the ground, which is marvellous. Uh, the Inkahuma pride, which have moved a fairly substantial difference, difference distance since this morning. Now, probably about seven kilometres, which in miles is, well, it's roughly five miles, just under five miles, which for, during the course of a hot day like this is unusual. There's a few interesting theories as to why that might have happened. The Talamati pride with their youngsters would have been very careful of coming across a pride like this. And I know that they have moved north. They were around Sydney's dam. I suspect there was some kind of interaction there. And these guys got a fright and headed off here just to try and put some distance between them 
and the Talamati Pride. Now, the Talamati Pride operates north into Biffles Hook and the Manileti, and that Sydney's dam area on the corner of Juma, where we traverse, is kind of a territorial boundary. And I wonder if they didn't have an interaction that made them scuttle off to the side of the reserve. We are now on the far east, just north of Biffles Hook Dam. And you can see the lions are fast asleep, very relaxed. <laughs> Hello, Gracie. Nice to hear from you this afternoon. You want to know why some animals go potty while standing up and some others go while squatting. Gracie, I think it's probably got quite a lot to do, you'll find, with how they are with how they are structured. Um, if you look at a dog or a cat, you can see that it's very difficult. If they go potty while they're standing up, they're gonna make a mess all over themselves. Whereas if you're something like an elephant, where um, you can stand and go potty and you don't make a mess on yourself. So I think that's probably why. Although buffalo, of course, are an exception. Uh, when they go to the loo, they tend to make a huge amount of mess on themselves, which is pretty disgusting, really. I think also you'll find, Gracie, that animals like carnivores are the ones that tend to squat. And that's because they're done. It's probably a lot more poisonous. It's got a lot more toxic stuff in it. Um, it's a lot smellier than herbivore dung. Whereas animals like herbivores, zebras, buffalo, elephant, all of that, their dung is just basically chewed up plants. And that's not very poisonous at all. And I think that's probably why you'll find that it doesn't matter if it's not that unhealthy if there's a bit of dung on them. But for a carnivore like this, I think it's very unhealthy to be anywhere near the dung. That would be my guess. Also, last thing that could be the reason is that carnivores like this, which squat when they go to the loo, obviously uh, use their dung for territory. So they want to be accurate as to where they put it. I think that might have something to do with it. Anyway, Gracie, I don't think it's something that should worry you too much. Uh, let's have a look again at the lions. And let's, I'm just gonna move a little bit closer now that Tax has moved out. Get a slightly better view. I think it's gonna be worth sitting here, everyone, until the end of drive, just to see what they do, simply because it is going to get dark fairly soon. The sun is about to dip under the, over the horizon. And it's, they might move, so that hyena den is active and stuff is going on there. I think it might be worth just sitting here for a while and seeing what goes on. All right, now just off to the side now. Zebra armchair Tavoli, you're very pleased to see the lions, but you hope that they stay away from the zebra for a bit. Uh, Deborah, I think that they are nowhere near where Dave and my special little godchild was born the other day, and so I don't think that they're likely to have any effect on those zebra that we saw the other day, which is a relief. Let's try and identify our four Nkuhuma lionesses. There's only four here, one missing. Not sure where she is. She was the one uh, with the slightly slanty eyes that was with that Nkuhu, um Oh, dear. With that Birmingham boy the other day. So, Dave, yeah, there we go. That's, that's the sub-adult. I think absolutely no spotties on the nose. Completely spot-free pink nose. Well, one or two little spots, but not much. And the one next to her is completely black on the nose, so she's the oldest one. Then we've got the semi-spotted nose one there, to the left there, Dave. And there we go. And then that must be amber eyes at the far end over there. Right, Jamie has got some elephants feeding into the sunset. Wonderful sighting. We'll wait here with the lions. We don't want to take you away from the Nkuhumas for too long, although I am thrilled that James found them. I'm also quite chuffed that I called that they, they were going to be around the dam, around Buffalsook Dam, but we just have to show you this stunning view 
of the elephants in the sunset. Having a quick dust bath. Doesn't even really need narration, this. Such a beautiful sighting, it speaks for itself. A full breeding herd moving through. Look at the dust in that light. With the silhouette of marula trees behind them. One of Africa's most beautiful trees. And to enjoy a sighting like this is such a privilege. Hornbills calling in the background, starlings chirping away. An oriole whistling. There you go. Let's just have a quick listen to the sounds of the evening. The sounds you were listening to, buffalo weavers, also particularly vocal, they like to nest around our repeater and around the fever trees outside the camp. That's the constant chirping. You would also have heard the hornbills, cook, 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 cook and the call of a crested Franklin as well. And then that little whistle was the black-headed Oriole. And there's nothing quite like the peace that these gentle giants can impart. We were discussing it earlier and the fact that no matter what kind of mood you're in, a scene like this is guaranteed to improve it. Ava Brooks is loving this afternoon's sunset drive. Ava was saying Ellie's and lions and plus one art fark, slightly deceased. And it really couldn't get better than this. Oh, just listen to, if you can, another bird has joined in the chorus. <laughs> Quiz time. Our regular viewers should know what that is. Calling in the background. Brr. Brr. What little bird has joined our particular group? I'm putting that forward as a question. And as always, you can send that through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And it should be a relatively easy one. I'm pretty sure most of you will, or most of our regular viewers will get that very quickly. I'm looking for him, I promise, but I think he might be in a garden rather than out on quarantine. Dust bath time.
<laughs> little one. Run, 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 run. <laughs> Is that exciting? Is it so exciting? Hmm? Running to the safety of mom or granny or auntie. It's a wonderful thing about being a baby elephant in a herd like this is that everybody loves you. It's like a little precocious child. The whole herd is geared towards the youngsters. Using their trunks to coat themselves in dust. I think it just feels nice to be completely honest. They really do enjoy doing that. Beautiful scenes as the light starts to disappear and it gets a little bit cooler. There's always the chance that the lions might decide to be up and on the move. And since they do seem to be lifting their heads, let's jump onto the back of James's vehicle and have a look. Right, everybody, welcome back to the Lions. They, as you can see, have done nothing since we were last with you. One of them has sat its head up and so, oh, no, gone back down again. Now, this is typical. As the sun has gone down, what will happen is that they will start to kind of sit up a little bit and then lie down again and look tired. And then they'll probably get up and greet each other once or twice. And once they've done that, they'll probably sleep a bit more. And then as it gets dark, I suspect they'll head down towards the water, maybe to have a bit of a drink. There's lots of Anyala activity around there uh, before we got here. So I suspect if they were clever about it, and I'm not convinced of the genius of Panthera Leo, the African lion, um, if they were clever, they would lurk just about next to the water's edge and wait for something to come down and eat. They look pretty well fed. They don't look like they've eaten two minutes ago, but they certainly don't look particularly skinny or in need of food. Sounds like the most magnificent elephant sighting you were having there. That's really great. Now, I'd love to know if anybody has any ideas as to where you think perhaps the fifth member of this pride is. I really couldn't tell you at this stage. We haven't heard of her for a while. There hasn't been a lot of activity on Torchwood over the last few days, so maybe she's gone there with that, or well, except that she split from her consort. Remember, she split from that Birmingham boy and Scott, who found him the other morning, and she had moved away from him. But the last time we saw her, and just a reminder, she's the obviously kind of slanty-eyed one. She's uh, got slightly narrower eyes than the others, and she was calling, making that soft mm. 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 sound, which is a, you know, it's a call for the rest of the pride. She hasn't found them. Why she hasn't is anyone's guess. They did spend quite a lot of time on Simbambili, which is quite a long way to the west of here, and that's from whence they came this morning. Hello, Mike. Um, Mike, please remember next time you speak with us, tell us where you're from. It's just so nice to know which part of the world you might be viewing us from. But Mike, a very valid question. Where are all the, li the male lions? Well, Mike, if you have watched The Lion King, and I suspect you probably have, um, you might be under the impression that a male lion is part of the pride. That, of course, is untrue. A pride consists of the females like this, and the males will normally have a territory that encompasses two or more female pride territories. So what that means is that you do not often find the males with the females at all. Now, quite often, the females are lying on their own like this or feeding on their own and actually actively avoiding contact with the males. I watched, the last time we watched these four with the other one, eating a zebra foal, uh, they could hear the Birmingham boys in whose territory they fall, under whose auspices they are, and, protection they fall. We heard them calling way to the south of us and they sort of sat up and looked like this 
and then carried on eating. They don't want to share their food with the males. The males steal their food from them. The male lion is a great scavenger out here. And so while there are males around, um, they're not often with the pride. Now, why don't we see them more often? Well, our traversing area, um, although not small, it's about 2,400 hectares, and not hectares, um, 4,000 acres, 1,500 hectares. That, for a male lion coalition, is tiny. So they will have a territory of probably almost 10 times that, or if not 10 times, probably up to 10,000 hectares. So that would be 24,000 acres. So they will sometimes be here and sometimes they won't. And at the moment, they're not coming a lot onto Juma where we traverse simply because they don't need to. There is no pressure on them from the north, from other male coalitions. There's quite a lot of pressure to the west and the east and the south. And so they will spend their time in those areas trying desperately to keep other males away from the area. Up here, there's just no roaring coming out of the north, which means they don't feel the need to try and protect what's going on. Nice question, Mike. Thank you for that. Sarah, you say the lion that sat up and looked at us had a puncture mark under her chin. Um, Sarah, we will definitely try and have a look there if she deigns to wake up and have a look at us as opposed to lie there, which she has, of course, been doing for probably the last mm, eight or nine hours. You can see them panting a bit. That's the heat. They're not full. They're not skinny, like I say, but they definitely are not full either. So we're one of those large nyala to pop down to the water to have a drink. You can be sure that it would be in some trouble. Hello, Mia. You are just 11 years old, and you're a budding naturalist and an African wildlife enthusiast, obviously. You want to know how big a lion pride can get. Remember, the collective noun for lion is pride. We use pack for dogs and pride normally for lions, which are the only social cats. Um, Mia, you want to know how big a pride can get? Well, in this area, they can get up to 30, but that's very unusual. And normally, then, the pride will split because it's very difficult to feed 30 people. 30 people. It's very difficult to feed 30 people, but it's even more difficult to feed 30 lions. Okay, Jamie is still with a very active, very playful elephant calf. Let's head back there. We'll stay with the lions and see what they do. And I'm afraid I've decided to change my plans. I'm not racing off to the hyena den. It's going to get dark very quickly. We just have to enjoy this incredible elephant sighting in the most beautiful setting. And this little boisterous boy has been galloping across a quarantine, full of the joys of spring or summer, late summer, I suppose would be a better term. Happy that the weather's cooled down a little bit enjoying the safety of the herd and the nice open space for him to run around. He just tripped over a termite mound just a couple of moments before when you were with James, which is truly entertaining to witness. What are you going to do? Oh! <laughs> I'm a big, fearsome elephant, I am. And I'm going to push this over. Or not. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. No, wait, wait for me, wait for me, wait for me, tail out. Excitement, water's, we're gonna go to water, I'm thirsty. Thirsty, 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 come on guys. I've got so much energy. Too sweet for words. And one tuskless female at the back there, coming onto the right of your screen. I'm pretty sure I know this female as well. Well done, Mike and Gerda 
and many, many others getting the Scops Owl quiz correct as we watch the disappearing bottoms of an elephant herd on its way to water. Yes, you were absolutely right. It was a Scops Owl. Fairly easy quiz. That burp, burp sound that we were listening to. Oh, this is going to be beautiful. There you go. It's always entertaining to watch the tales of the stragglers. They get slightly nervous that they might be maybe be left behind and their tails get all stiff and excited and they go running after them. I'm gonna go join them as they go for a drink. But yes, the Scops owl, a tiny, tiny little owl, only about this big. And when I have a moment, if we have a moment, I will show you a picture, but I don't want to stop just yet. But I'll show, for new viewers, I'll show you a picture of the little owl that we were looking at. A little owl that has a permanent expression of disapproval. And oh my word, these eddies are now galloping to the water hole. Oh, I love that smell. And while I race down towards the dam to get ahead with the Ellies. We'll pop back over to the lions briefly and then we'll be back with you shortly. Yeah, that work for you. We're live. Are you, are you joking? Hello everybody, sorry about that. Um, my, my communication device seems to have detached itself, which is deeply embarrassing, but here we are. Anyway, the lions, I'm back, Louise, sorry about that. The lions are, as you can see, doing nothing at all. And uh, one of them sat up, moved, sat down again, and has gone to sleep, entirely in keeping with what was expected. Remember, at this stage of the night, they will be slowly waking up as the temperature drops a little bit, and then they will move about, hopefully down to drink, sometime soon. But otherwise, all is quiet. The birds are not stinging. And so we're going to stay here. And I believe you're going to join the elephants again shortly to see them have a drink. Uh, Margreta, you want to know about what happens when lions meet leopards. Uh, it's not pretty for the leopards, Margreta. The leopards will get out of the way as fast as they possibly can. And they'll probably climb a tree to escape the attentions of lions. There is a real kind of competition. Well, not competition, there's a, there's, all the predators will kill each other if they can. Now, a leopard, of course, is half the size of the lion. Let's go straight across to the elephants. They're running for the water. Look at them go. Elephant water walk. Oh, so excited. So excited for a drink. <laughs> little one running along, uh, maybe not as convinced as to why everybody's running, but just joining along. Shame. Oh, such thirsty elephants. Relief. Whoopsie, slightly overshot the mark there, guys. Pushing and shoving. That high squealing sound that you just heard was actually came from some zebra, but we'll stay looking at the elephants for now. Look at the little one. Oh, face first. Hello. It's all right. It's all right, little girl. Oh, what a stunning, stunning sighting. <laughs> Getting shoved out of the way. That's not very nice. Play nicely around the waterhole. Look at that. Baby practicing its arabesque in the water. <laughs> oh, <laughs> face full of water. Hey, now, you two. One of the elephants just got a bit of a shock. But that baby face first into the water. That's what's so much fun about them when they're that age. They haven't quite worked out how to use their trunk as a straw. Of course, elephants don't drink through their trunk, but they do use it to transport the water from the dam into their mouths. But the little one hasn't quite mastered that technique, and so 
is going head first. This is awesome. That's a little one. That's what that extension on the end of your face is for. Well done. Here we go. A huge female at the back. She's almost certainly the matriarch of this particular herd. She was the one leading the way. She's going to come up and say hello. Oh, such happy elephants. There's the little boy that was being playful on quarantine. It's not the best spot to have picked for a drink, little one. Oh, she's beautiful. Hello, gorgeous girl. Contented, happy, suckling calf with its eyes closed. Drunk up out of the way. Oh, with all the wisdom of the years. She's not a young elephant. I would say definitely coming up to 40, if not older. Look at the indentations along her temporal area. Giving us a good sniff. Testing the air. Making sure, as the custodian of her family's safety, that all is well. And that incredible instrument that is an elephant's trunk. Her dexterous tips. It is used for anything from drinking to putting trees down to being stroking their youngsters gently. It is the most incredible thing. Whoopsie. I'm just keeping an eye on all of the elephants around us. Now, elephants with all of their complexities, <laughs> which includes on occasion sticking your trunk into your cousin's mouth or your brother's mouth. Little one, you're going to fall down. You are going to fall down. Whoop. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. This could end in tears, especially if it gets bumped from behind. Little one, why don't you go to the other side of the dam? <laughs> that is not your most intelligent approach. All right, big girl. Absolutely magical sighting. <laughs> Youngsters slightly better adapted at using their trunks. Oh, it's a good point from Lisa, who's watching the way that the Elephants use their trunks to drink, but then was wondering why do they not use their trunks to suckle? And the answer is that their mouth just forms a far more effective seal, plus the fact that it's easier for them. The, the nipple is perfectly head height for a youngster, the nipple between the front legs. It's much more difficult for them to get the suction needed to suckle through their trunks. It's easier to just go with the direct route, whereas reaching down to water, useful to have a... Hello, girl. How's it, big girl? Just going to sit here nice and still. Let her walk past us. Hi, gorgeous. Hello, big girl. Ah. Uh -uh. Beautiful. All right, big girl. And you, 
And you? Please don't touch my card. I want to shout at you. Hey, mischief. Sorry, guys. I moved my head. Hey, what you doing? What you doing? This is so beautiful. And you, little one? Have you come to say hello, too? Hey? Oh, oh, big and scary. Big and scary, little girl. Um, excuse me, please don't touch my car. Heels. Hello. Hello, girlies. Hello, girlies. Nicely now. Ah, yes. Mischief. And the last trunkless elephant. That was absolutely stunning. Grinning from ear to ear, I cannot tell you what that feels like, eh, Jandre? A phenomenal feeling. That was to have them come right close up to us and just surround us in a way that was so incredibly peaceful. All the babies coming up to explore the front of the car, you barely, I barely knew where to look. A sighting like that is indescribable. I really can't, I can't begin to describe it. My heart's actually beating faster, not because at any point did I feel threatened, but just the sheer magic nature of moments like that. Thank you, beautiful elephants. That was really, really kind of you. And that is where you let an animal approach you and decide where they feel comfortable with. And that matriarch stood for a long time assessing us. She had a short drink and then she came to watch us. And she decided that she was going to lead her family past us. And that was why the rest of them felt so incredibly confident in moving along us and past us. Absolutely magical. As we always say, and I'm going to do this just once, can you believe it? Just in honor of Scott Dyson. That was awesome. I'm going to send you back over to James. I'm going to leave this elephant herd to wander off into the night and we'll see what other magical things we can find you. As you can see, these lions have been very busy since you were last here watching a, what sounds like another spectacular elephant sighting. They have, uh, wag the one on the left there wagged its tail there, the second time. <clears throat> one in the middle there moved its back leg up and down once. One uh, sort of close, second closest to us flicked to the back end of its tail and the one towards us here flicked its left ear. So high action that you missed. Pity you were with the elephants. Should have been here watching the high action lion sighting that we have going at the moment. Dave really struggled to keep up with it all, didn't you, Dave? It was difficult to make your camera move with the speed required to capture everything that has happened here. Very tricky. Uh, very tricky. I was rather hoping by now they would have managed to get up off their backsides and do something useful, but they haven't. I, I still think it's worthwhile sitting here for a bit longer. We've got about half an hour left at the drive, and so let's maybe just chat about the lions for a while, and then maybe they will go down for a drink. Um, yeah, you know, they are several of crepuscular, not largely nocturnal, semi-crepuscular animals. So this is round about the time where they normally they'd be sort of sitting up and yawning as opposed to uh, being sort of comatose in a state of anesthesia. But uh, that is how it happens with lions. They're obviously not very hungry. Oh, 
don't look. Look at that. Oh, good grief. Hold on to your seats, everyone. Now, Ravi in New York, as the action of the sighting becomes almost unbearable, um, you want to know, do they need more sleep, or you suggest that perhaps they do need more sleep because they're carnivores. Ravi, I think it's got quite a lot to do with, as you say, to do with the digestion of protein, advanced uh, amounts or large amounts of protein. But the other thing, Ravi, is that Large amounts of protein, of course, are difficult to turn into energy. Now, if you eat a diet that is rich in carbohydrates, you've got quite a lot of sugars already in your diet. And so to create the energy to move around like an elephant does all day long or a buffalo is not too difficult. The limiting nutrient for many of the herbivores is, or limiting macro macronutrient is protein. The limiting macronutrient for animals like this would be carbohydrates. And I think that you'll find that largely the energy that they do get is made from the bone marrow, the fatty parts of the carcasses that they eat, most of which are pretty lean, especially in a drought time like this. So there's very little fat on any of the animals that they eat. And so to turn that fat into energy is easy. That's basically what we've evolved to do. But to turn the protein into energy is an expensive thing to do. And I think that's why you find they sleep so very much. And I think it's also why you find something like a wild dog will kill twice a day, because they need to get at the, the kind of fatty organs more than they need to get at the protein. They need to get at the fatty organs and the marrow of the animals that they eat so that they can maintain that incredible amount of work that the wild dogs do. Even they, though, or short bursts of two hours of activity each and then sleep. Much like these lions. Look, one of, them, one of them's lifted a leg there, Dave. You see that? Oh, and a tail. Good grief. Two legs up now. So I think a question from Gilly here about the effect of the drought on, say, hypothesizing that if there were some young lions here learning to hunt, and obviously it's an easier time, or perhaps not so obviously, but it is an easier time for them to hunt when there is the drought because the leaves and trees are more sparsely situated, and so it's kind of, well, it's not necessarily for a stalking predator much easier, but the animals are weaker and so probably easier to catch. Now you say, will that affect young lions learning to hunt in an environment like this when, you know, times of heavier rain and thicker bush and stronger herbivores prevail, will it be more difficult for them to hunt? Um, yes, I imagine it probably would be easier, but I don't think to the extent that it would actually make it more difficult for them to hunt. Let me just move this light. Dave, how's that? Is that better? There we go. No, there we go. I thought the light was angled correctly, but it wasn't. So they're now shining. Well, they're not shining so much as uh, lit by a little floodlight on the side of the vehicle. And you can see how lighting affects lions uh, in not one jot. Jess, you want to know if the fifth lioness is with the Birmingham boys? Mm, I don't know, Jess. Like I said, the other day we saw her with one of the Birmingham boys, but then the next morning he was found on his own and she was seen disappearing off towards Torchwood on her own. So I haven't heard that she's with the other, uh, with the other um, Birmingham boys. And I did hear that the Styx Pride was with three of the Birmingham boys today, somewhere on Cheetah Plains. So, yeah, I don't know where this other lioness is. It's slightly worrying, given the Birmingham boys' record of, uh, well, basically killing lionesses. Lots and lots of flies on that fly, which are obviously very active, unlike the lions. Uh, Rick Mayer, nice one. You just watched that um, documentary on YouTube called, I think it's was called Blood Brothers or something like that, about the Mapojo. And the Mapojo Pride, uh, not Pride, is a coalition, were a group of male lions that came into this area in the year 2006, if I'm not, no, seven, 2007. It was just when I started again in the Lofeld for my second stint. And 
You want to know about how long they lasted? Actually, not very long. They came in as a coalition of five, one, much like these Birmingham boys, actually. One of them much older than the other four. They killed a lot of lionesses. They killed a lot of lions. And they took over, and they ruled only for about two and a half years. That's totally normal. It's completely understandable. It's normally only as long as a coalition of lions will last. Only about two and a half years, Rick. And then they were replaced by the Majingalani, who have managed to maintain actually for much longer than that. It may have been three years. Uh, there's a little puncture mark there. That looks like a fight. Fight mark. And Sarah, you noticed that immediately because uh, you're obviously very astute and you noticed that puncture mark. I actually saw that the last time we saw this lioness as well. Um, I wonder what it's from. I would suspect quite strongly a claw fighting over food with the other lionesses. I think that's probably what's happened there. Sarah? So those Mapojos were then replaced by the Majingalan coalition. Those Majingalans are still around now. And they've been around, whew, probably four years. It's a long time for a male coalition, especially given the number of males in the area. They are being squeezed, though. They're moving, they're getting old, and they're moving off sort of towards the western sectors of the Kruger Park, um, of the Sabi Sands, but they're still holding on. Remember that a male lion that lives beyond 10 out here is unusual. 12 is uh, amazing, 14 is astounding. And the 16-year-old Sparta pride males of Londolozi uh, that died, I think, in, when would it have been? It would have been in late 2003, probably. They were a complete miracle. And while their age cannot be categorically put at 16, uh, the record age of, that is most accurately measured was of a 16-year-old lion in Itosha. So a 16-year-old lion here, especially the Kruger region, is very old. <laughs> Hello, Sibur <laughs> Siso uh, from Havans Kral. Sibur Siso, you want to know, do, are there any um, descendants of the Mapojo in the Sabi Sands, plenty, many, many lions. Those belonging to the Salala Pride, most of the Salala Pride will be descendants of the Mapojo, except the very newest members, which we will be Majingalans. Um, what else? I think lots of the Sparta Pride, probably some of the Styx Pride uh, may be related certainly to the Mapojo. Sorry, that was my hand there, hello. Um, and I think you'll find where else? Certainly in the western sectors of the Sabi Sands, many of the lions now adult operating uh, will be descendants of the Mapojo. Mostly they will be females. The males that belong to the Mapojo would have been chased off by the Majingalana when they came in here. They will be plying their trade in the Kruger and in the Manuleti and possibly in the eastern sectors of the Sabi Sands. I don't know where the Salati males came from. Uh, they could be descendants of the Mapojo. They're up sort of in southern Manileti and northern Buffelshook. They could be descendants. I don't, the Birmingham boys are almost certainly not. They come from a farm well north of here called, ironically, Birmingham, which is in the Tumbavati. Also part of the greater Kruger National Park. You're in Philadelphia and you want to know if I think these lions might sleep longer because of the lengthy walk that they had earlier today. Laura, yes, I think they, they, they might, you know. I mean, like I say, it's difficult for them to produce energy. They don't look particularly hungry at the moment. So they may well just be exhausted after their prolonged sojourn of 45 minutes across the reserve. And now they're lying here. Um, yeah, I didn't think of it like that, Laura, but I think that that's, that's quite a good guess. Quite a good thought. That wound is not fatal by any stretch of the imagination. It actually looks like a puncture from a tooth. I think she was bitten, quite possibly by one of her sisters, or her mother, or an aunt.
Now, Keith and Long Island, yes, they are. You say, are the lionesses in a pride related to each other? More than likely, more often than not, yes. They are sisters, and then the next generation, of course, will be cousins, and the generation after that will be second cousins, and from there, the pride, if it stays together, will become so big that it will split up. And so, yes, these ones will be related to each other. Um, I think the oldest one has got at least two daughters within this pride and the other is probably a sibling of the oldest one. So if you can just figure out how that would work. If all, let's pretend we've got all five here, and over the course of their breeding lives, which would be from two and a half, say, to eight or to ten, they'll produce maybe, say, conservatively three litters of cubs each, let's say, at a conservative average of two each, so that's three times two to six times four, which is 24 lions are ready. If they have one successful kind of uh, generation, or one successful breeding lot, they're gonna have 24 lions within this pride, so they'd already start to split. You can see how quickly a population can grow up when you look at it like that. Of course, uh, probably about 10% of male lions actually make it to adulthood where they take a territory and probably about mm, maybe 50%, 40 or 50% of females will make it to adulthood. They're doing precisely what I thought they would not and that by now I thought they would be up and having a drink and looking to try and kill something. Sean Holder, um, you want to know, you're in Secunda, what my favorite animal is to photograph and why. Um, David, do you take still photos? Um, not really. Not really. Not the video. Um, I, I'm the wrong person to ask, Sean, because I am not a, a great cameraman. Um, I'll actually show you my media equipment, if you like. Um, and I'm more a landscape photographer, Sean. That's what I like to call myself. Basically, that means I don't have a lens long enough to take, uh, to take pictures of lions. Uh, here is my camera, Sean. You see? This is a mirrorless, a mirrorless camera. Uh, it takes very nice pictures, but it's not what you'd call a uh, world-class wildlife phot photography camera. Uh, the other thing that I use to take quite a lot of a, a video is this uh, very clever device here which could also astoundingly be used to talk to people across vast distances. I find that amazing. Um, and so at the moment, with this particular swathe of uh, amazing media equipment, uh, the thing I like to photograph most are those hyenas because they come so close to the vehicle that you don't need to have a lens, basically. So hyenas at the moment, I guess it would be wild dogs if I had a, a really nice camera. Um, I've just kind of, every time I've had, uh, a few times in my life I've had the cash to spend on a big camera, um, I've kind of tended towards buying another guitar, which is, I'm not sure if it's wise or not, but it's certainly made me very happy. And the thing about photography, Sean, for me is that if you, um, if you, if you're going to dedicate yourself to taking great wildlife shots, then I think it's worth it. But, for example, to take a great w shot of a leopard in a tree, it just doesn't interest me that much because there are thousands of people doing it and thousands of people taking amazingly good leopard shots. And so unless you're prepared to kind of, um, I don't know, make the expenditure and take the time to go and edit and go through thousands of headshots of leopards sitting in a tree, to me it doesn't really make sense. There are lots of guys around here who do do it and do it exceptionally well. Um, I just prefer the scenery and that sort of stuff. So normally I'm taking pictures of the sun, uh, which to my mother's great chagrin is all I have to show for my time out here in the bush, photography-wise. Okay, I'm, I'm about to give up on these lines. Um, I think we'll sit here just for a few more minutes and then we'll see. That's interesting. Ravi, very nice question. Um, you want to know if I think that lions, because of their, uh, or you say that lions and hyenas seem to have a very similar diet, and why is it therefore that a lion is so tired all the time and a hyena seemingly not? A hyena is able to operate 
and seemingly be a lot more active. Uh, Ravi, I think that your postulation that they are um, that the hyenas are getting or get a lot better. Uh, David, did you really take a picture of me taking a terrible picture? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's such a horrible picture. <laughs> Ravi, I think, I think that uh, you're right. The hyenas get hold of a lot more. They can crush into the bone marrow, suck out the fat, and they also carry less weight. And so I think you find that is indeed why they are more active. Remember, the adults are not, though. It's normally the youngsters that are running around, especially when we see them. The youngsters are often doing all of the activity and the adults are not doing much at all. Right, I'm now going to take an epic photograph of these lions, which I will then show you, and you will be sore amazed at my photographic skills. This is going to be epic, Dave. Here we go. Now, Dylan, you're in Iowa. You want to know about the swamp cats of Botswana, and obviously they do a lot of swimming in the water there. And you want to know if that is a sort of typical or acceptable way for a lion to live. Uh, Dylan, it, they are amazingly adaptable. In, in Botswana, in the Okavango Delta, they spend a lot of time in the water swimming. And I know the lions, I think the swamp cats one was probably shot around Duba Plains and there are a succession of islands and channels there. And if the lions want to get at the buffalo around there, then they have to swim a great deal. They're very accomplished swimmers, doesn't seem to affect them much, and certainly they kill a lot of buffalo there, and they actually get a lot bigger than the lions here because of the amount that they eat there. Thank you, Dylan. Would you like to see my photograph? Isn't that amazing, David? Do you think I should submit it for a cover photograph? Absolutely. Of a... Yes. I think it's beautiful. The colors are so nice. I love the washed out light on the lions. It's particularly impressive. Good. Uh, that wasn't a star in the top of the frame, by the way, everybody. It's a, it's a blemish on my screen. Ah, here we go. One of them moving, two of them moving. Now, Luke, you were out here last week with Brent Leo Smith. He was driving you around, and I think you were privileged enough to witness that incredible lion, at least zebra kill, with this pride. And you want to know how often they have to eat. Well, Luke, they, the last time we saw them eating was that zebra that you saw being haplessly killed. And I don't know that they've eaten, have they eaten since then? They would have eaten since then. Um, I'm not sure what they've eaten. Oh, I do know, they've eaten a buffalo. They ate a young buffalo, I think, on Simbambili. So they've eaten once since you were last there, so say every three or four days or so, they'll need to eat something sort of young buffalo-sized. That little thing that you saw them eating wouldn't have done them very long, and as, as you certainly were told by Brent, they only ate that for about mm, 45 minutes before they finished up and moved off. Thank you, Luke. And I hope you had a great time out here. OK, let's go back to Jamie. She'll tell you one or two more things. Uh, I'm hoping these lions will do something. Uh, I don't know if they will. Over to Jamie. We'll sit here for a bit longer. After. <laughs> <laughs> I, I drove over a stick that then attempted to kill my passengers. <laughs> um, sorry, Chandra, sorry, Candace, you're all alive back there. <laughs> Sometimes when you get them at exactly the right, exactly the right angle, just to explain who Candace is, by the way, Candace is the very capable manager of Vuitella and Gallagher. She is. You've met her before, many of the regular viewers. You've, you've encountered her before. And she lives, she's our next door neighbor, essentially. So yes, we have taken her on a bit of a, a drive with us just to show her a bit about what we do and also be able to show her things from our perspective. Right, I mean, completely um, waylaid by that sudden magical stick sighting. If you get them at the right angle, they really do fling right up. <laughs> I 
as we slowly make our way back towards camp. Judy, who is watching in Ohio, was wondering about, obviously James mentioned the sighting we had of the little lesser bush baby, or the lesser Gallego. And it was, it, I'm not sure if it had fallen, the little one had fallen out of its nest. It looked quite young to me. But Judy, it just happened to be on the, around the camp and it climbed slowly up the fence and then moved back into the tree into wherever its little nest site is. It was just obviously quite surprised and moving quite slowly, I think still asleep. It does occasionally happen that they overbalance and they fall over. Oops, see, roadblock. Elephants doing some oh, landscaping. I better dodge the one rock in the Sabi Sands. There we go. But an absolutely magical evening, and a sighting like that with elephants will put me in a good mood for the rest of the week, probably. I'm still grinning from ear to ear about it. When they are peaceful in that way, in that kind of mood, when you can read from their body language that they are quite happy when they've chosen to approach you it makes it all the more magical because you get to have a connection to a magical animal like that and it is a connection it is very much a coherent sentient connection i'm going to say a very quick goodbye i'm going to say a big thank you to jandre and to all of you for joining us on the back of the vehicle and i'm going to send you back across to james for the last few moments of the sunset safari cheers everyone see you tomorrow Um, well, they got up, they looked, and they lay down again. One of them is still looking. It was not the direction the rest of them were looking. I think maybe they heard something having a drink. Oh, having a bit of a stretch. And this is very typical. Kind of move around a bit, have another sleep for an hour, and then get going. It's still hot, you know. The temperature's hardly dropped at all. But this is kind of how they get going. I just expected it to happen sort of half an hour earlier. Suddenly they all stood up, and then we thought we were into, th into things. David started fluttering with excitement. I lit up all the lights, all the trees around here, the spotlights. And then... Back to sleep they went. Leslie, thank you for your honest feedback on my photographic skills. You say I should stick with guitars. I couldn't agree more, Leslie. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always good to get some, uh, you know, some honest feedback. One doesn't ever want to go into life uh, with the impression that you're better at something than you actually are. That lioness is still tired and therefore yawning. Oh, grief, could you at least keep your eyes open while we look at you? <laughs> now, Gracie, this is precisely the question that my mother asks me when I show her my photographs. Now, you say you loved my picture, but you're confused as to whether it was actually of the lions or the sky. You say you're not being mean to me, Gracie. I don't think it's possible for you to be mean to me. Um, so I don't take it as you being mean to me. Uh, the, the picture was sort of supposed to be both, Gracie, the lions in the foreground and the sky in the background. Unfortunately, um, the lighting is not really great for that kind of a picture, and the lions weren't actually doing anything. So you need to really, if you've got a really fancy camera like that, like I don't have, Gracie, and you've got r nice lighting and you've got lots of time and the lions are sitting up, you can get a picture of, say, the lions sitting in the foreground, and then you can get the stars in the background, and that would be a really nice picture. That was sort of the idea I was going for, but uh, putridly, putridly executed. Really high action now, cleaning of the face before perhaps either having another sleep or getting up. 
You can hear something going on at the water. I suspect something having a drink there. Right, well, that's, I'm afraid, pretty much it from us, everybody. We're going to make our way slowly home from here. A big thank you to all of you for your comments and questions. Very stimulating discussions we had today. And quite a, quite a highlight to find that, um, that Artfark, unfortunately, haplessly dead there in the, um, in the bush. But at least we got some really good shots. Thank you, David. Thank you, Louise and Kirsten. Thank you, of course, to Jamie. And she was being filled by Jean-Dre. We will see you tomorrow at 05.30 in the dawn light. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>